Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is State Treasurer Dale Falwell welcoming everyone to the Supplemental Retirement Board of Trustees meeting of May 25th at 9 a.m. Uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, agenda items to go over today, but first I'll call the meeting to order uh, and I'll ask Tom, uh, representing any other veteran who might be in the room or on the line, uh, as we get ready to celebrate Memorial Day for him to lead us in our Pledge of Allegiance and our salute to the flag. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I salute the flag of North Carolina, pledged to the old North State, love, loyalty, and faith. Thank you very much. And with that, uh, uh, audience and those joining us uh, uh, elsewhere, we do have a public comment section. And please uh, email if you'd like to sign up for our public comment. Please note that our meeting is being recorded and posted online with the board materials. We ask that anybody who's joining us online, uh, when they're not speaking, please mute their phone or computer uh, so that we, the rest of us can better. I will be taking our roll call votes by name and for all votes and unless there's an objection, a motion and a second will be counted as a yes vote for efficiency purposes. Hearing no objection, uh, board members, if you must leave the meeting at any time, please announce your departure. If you return, please announce your return. All items <clears throat> must be recorded. These items must be recorded in the meeting minutes. And uh, in addition, any time that you speak, uh, be sure to mention your name for meeting minutes. Uh, most importantly, any text or other recorded communication between board members during the meeting, even on personal cell phones, are deemed public record to the extent that they concern the meeting's uh, agenda. And with that, we'll call the roll. Treasurer Falwell. Here. Shabella Thomas. Present. Lorraine Johnson. Present. Jim Lumsden. Here. Greg Patterson. Here. Bob Shea. Nils Roseland. Here. Steve Bean. Here. And Wyndon Hitler. Here. Thank you all. Uh, next, I have the great pleasure of uh, introducing our newest uh, board member uh, who is, has big heels to fill. That's a little treasure and humor. So, uh, Belinda Barron has been on this board for a long period of time, and, and uh, you're going to be uh, you're sitting in, in her position uh, because she was term limited out. Uh, I want to not only extend a warm welcome. Uh, to our newest board member, Greg Patterson, but a, a personal thank you for accepting this. He is a appointee of the President Pro Tem uh, to the Supplemental Retirement Board of Trustees. He is replacing Melinda Barron, uh, and he has previously served for many years on our teachers board and has a very strong connection, both uh, professionally and personally with our uh, retirement systems. And not only that, with the uh, communities across North Carolina. He brings extensive experience in finance and wealth management as well as an established impact on operations and processes. I look forward to his contributions as I have in, when he served on the other board and, uh, and, it, and the experience that he will bring to uh, our rich, diverse, and active board. Uh, Greg, I'd like, to, excuse me, I'd like to welcome you. And with that, if you'll join me, for the rest of the square you go. Thank you. Okay. All right. If you'll place your left hand on the Bible and raise your right hand. Uh, I'm now administering the oath to you, Greg Patterson, solemnly affirm that you will support and maintain the Constitution and laws of the United States and that, and not inconsistent therewith, and that you will faithfully discharge the duties of your office as trustee of the Supplemental Retirement Board of the State of North Carolina. So help you God. I do. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you, sir.
pay is the same as it is on Teaser Sport. I didn't see any granola bars. We used to have granola bars at the other uh, meetings. <laughs> it's a supplemental board. Oh, okay. <laughs> And the granola bars and the coffee uh, are in the kitchen. So, anyway, <laughs> thank you so much and thank you for agreeing to do this. Glad to, sir. Uh, with that, uh, we'll go through our ethics awareness and identification of conflicts or potential conflicts. Members, please uh, check your agenda, take a moment to review. Uh, does anybody have an actual potential or appearance of a conflict of interest regarding any matters that are before us? With that, uh, the SCI reports are coming in, and in, our, in your appendix, you'll find the SCI evaluation for our newest board member, Greg Patterson. The Ethics Act requires that any conflicts of interest identified in the evaluation be recorded in meeting minutes. So the evaluation letter will be made a part of today's minutes to serve as a periodic reminder of these conflicts uh, as identified by the Ethics Board. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, adopting the resolution of the uh, service of Melinda Barron as a member of the Supplemental uh, Retirement Board of Trustees. Uh, that uh, resolution is in your packet. Uh, you know, words can't describe the uh, the commitment that Melinda has made, not just with her mind, but with her uh, intuition and with her heart uh, over the last several years. And uh, <clears throat> we uh, appreciate her service and uh, given that, uh, to entertain a motion to adopt this resolution. So moved. Thank you. Second. So second. second. Okay. Motion is second being made. Um, with that, uh, the clerk will call. Any further discussion? Given hearing none, uh, the clerk will call the roll. Treasurer Falwell. Aye. Lorraine Johnson. Aye. James Lumston. Aye. Greg Patterson. Aye. Wendon Hepler? Aye. Steve Bain? Aye. Bob Shea? Aye. Thank you all very much. And uh, our next item is to uh, the ratification of Bob Shea's appointment to the all important audit subcommittee. Uh, members, you also have that in your board book, uh, appointing him uh, to the audit subcommittee. And uh, the board, our charter requires. Uh, uh, the chair and myself to appoint subcommittee members subject to ratification of the full board. Do I have a motion to ratify Bob Shea's appointment to the audit subcommittee? So moved. Steve. Bill Thomas second. Bob was a little worried about that for a minute. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, motion second being made. Any further discussion? Hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Treasurer Falwell. Aye. Lorraine Johnson. Lorraine. Sorry, I'm trying to find my mic. To find my mic. <laughs> James, James Lumsden. Here. Here. Greg Patterson. Aye. Bob Shea. Can I vote? Can I vote? <laughs> Probably shouldn't. <No. laughs> Nels. Okay. Roseland. Aye. And Wendy Nibbler. Aye. The ayes have it. Bob, how would you have voted? <laughs> <laughs> Could have been a reluctant uh, appointee. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, uh, board, and thank you, Bob, for agreeing to do that. Uh, you bet. Read to, uh, is there an objection to combining the approval of meeting minutes into one? Uh, without objection, I'd like to entertain a motion to approve the meeting minutes of the board meeting of February 23rd, as well as the meeting minutes of February 15th of the audit subcommittee kickoff board meeting. Hearing no objection, I to entertain a motion. So moved. So moved. Okay. Thank Second. you, Greg. Second. Who was the motion, Greg? Greg. Chabella was second, I think. Motion second being made. Any further discussion? Okay, hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Uh, Treasurer Falwell? Aye. Uh, Lorraine Johnson? Aye. James Lumsden? Aye. Wyndon Hibbler? Aye. Steve Bean? 
Uh, I, I, but I have one question in that I had suggested, and I did not go back and look today. They were amended, but one word changed. I had suggested in the minutes. The changing of the one word. Yes. But believe that was captured. Okay, I had, oh, oh, I had a chance to look at it, but yes, otherwise, thank you. Yeah, we will, we will, we will make sure that that was captured. And as chair, I would say that uh, uh, this motion that's before us would uh, that there would be uh, the uh, discretion of the staff to change the word as uh, was just that Steve just brought up if it had not already been changed. Could have been smoother, but I could have said that a little smoother, but I didn't, so anyway, keep going. Nils Rosler? Aye. And Bob Shea? Aye. Thank you. Moving right along, uh, we're already to uh, Jeff Hancock to talk about administrative matters uh, and an update, uh, which uh, will require a couple of things regarding the, the board vote. Thank you, Treasurer. Um, so as, as the board knows, we, we review our fees every year, um, along with our, uh, our fee expense reserve account. Um, as you may recall, um, in February of last year, the board voted to cut our fee in half from two and a half basis points to one and a quarter basis points as we had, as we had ample reserves. And our goal was to slowly chip away at those reserves. Well, as we reviewed our current position um, and recognizing that we've seen an increase in our float revenue and our float revenue is, is uh, interest we earn on checks that are outstanding awaiting presentment. And um, we've seen with the rise in the interest rates, that has gone from a, a very, very immaterial amount of about $35,000 a year to where rates are today. And we're seeing that we might be, at the current rates, we may collect over a million dollars this year from that. So um, from I recognize- 35,000 to a million. We went from a quarter of a basis point to almost 5% on what that account earns. Okay. Um, that multiplies properly. And so in, in, in a recognition of that, again, we're, we're, our goal is to chip away at the reserves that we have. And with this new, new monies coming in at the rate that it is, uh, we would like to propose to the board that we further reduce the fee from one and a quarter basis points to one basis points in hopes of of, uh, of uh, chipping away at, at those reserves. So I'll pause there and see if anyone has any questions. From what to what again? From one and a quarter to one. Okay. Uh, the document says one point three five. Yeah. Excuse me. The the document says one point two five. So we're, we're currently at one. We want to reduce it by another 0.25 basis points to one basis point. Oh, oh gotcha. Okay. okay. You said one basis point. Yeah. You said 1.125 to one. I'm sorry. From 1.25 one. Okay. to one. Yes. Sorry. That's what I thought we had agreed on. Okay. okay. Good. All right. How uh, much motion we approve this? Steve. All right. We'll get a motion second on the table, and then we'll have plenty of time for discussion. Okay. Do I have a second? Yes, Bob Shea. Okay, thank you, Carl. Uh, and we have a, uh, no, the, Mr. Controller. The uh, reserve balance is significant. And with this change, the Federal Reserve and their ch change in interest policies has markedly ramped up, as you all know, in the last year. What I'm trying to sort out is if there's a bad scenario on the horizon and they markedly ramp down, do we have the basis at our court? Do we have the ability at our quarterly meetings to make adjustments if needed? Yes, we do. Okay. And, and, and from the folks that we've talked to, we think rates will 
will come back down a little bit, but we don't think they'll go back to where they were. Um, from what we've been told, we th they expect that they may come and rest between the three, the three, three and four percent range. Uh, but given where we currently are, no, that's helpful. Thank you. And the, just to just clarify, the process that we have under the statute would be: you would vote if you we needed to raise again. You would vote to raise. There'd be a comment period, and you come back at the next meeting. Based on those comments, you could approve it at that point. So there would there be just a one quarter delay. Gotcha. Great. What does a quarter of a basis point translate to in dollars? In terms of our 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 fee collection, it will actually reduce our fee by uh, about three hundred and seventy thousand dollars a year. Right. Thank you. James Jeff. Well, they asked my questions. I, I've always thought this is like the best, the best plan going in this that I've ever heard of in terms of expense. My, my worry was what was that if we couldn't, if we had a negative scenario. We, it's, especially given this treasurer's position in life, raising rates is hard to do. You know, taking them down is easy when things are great. Sometimes it's hard to raise them again. But not, they answer, the questions are answered. So, great. Right, thank you. Any other questions from the uh, from the audience? Yeah, this is Wyndon. Can you uh, just kind of go over the benefits of this? And so, is there is there a target reserve they have, and what is that target number? And um, what what is the overall benefits for this? I just wanted to know. Yeah. So um, I uh, put in the board materials. Um, a five-year run rate. Um, when in the last column, it, we we kind of target our reserves at about eighteen months worth of expenses. Mm -hmm. Okay. Three hundred and seventy thousand a year. Okay. And um, will hopefully allow us to uh, chip away at the reserves that have been built up. Uh, you know, certainly, I think the goal would be if we could just collect what we, you know, what we needed to each year um, to fund our expenses. And it's just you know, a, a fact of the matter that uh, that that these reserves accounts have built up over the years. And I think you're. I think you're coming in, breaking in and out. Your mic is going in and out. That's true. I didn't, so, I didn't hear all of that either. Okay, so we so we target to have about eighteen months worth worth of expenses and reserves. Currently, we have much more than that. Our goal is to chip away at those reserves, um, given the the increase in the float revenue that's going to be coming into those into those expense accounts. We were seeking to reduce the fee in efforts to not have the reserve accounts build up, but yet, but be reduced over time. Um, and I did include in the board material a five year run rate um, that uh, is a very, very conservative run rate that would hopefully uh, move us towards what our target reserves would be over the next five to six years. Uh, Wendon, great question. Follow up? No, I just wanted to make sure everybody knew and it was on the record. That's all. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, I will add as we were uh, setting the agenda and looking at the possibilities here and uh, Ray, I think you're quickly realizing that the, the SRP board is engaged, as engaged as the teachers board was on their issues. Uh, is it uh, going back to the uh, James and the controller's uh, comments? We don't we don't want to see a lot of volatility as far as these uh, what we charge to administer this plan. And as you said earlier, it's uh, we've got tailwind off of something we have no control over, which is interest rate earnings. And there's always an option to have done more. And, and uh, when I, three or four years ago, we took it to zero. 
<laughs> but the reason that we uh, the reason that we uh, are able to do what we're doing today is because of Sam Watts working with Tom and Jeff and others uh, through legislation because previously we had to do one or the other. We couldn't do anything in between. So what is coming before you today is the result of us, of the legislation that was passed that's allowing us to make the right, uh, Linda, to your point, to make the right uh, determination, not just for this year, but maybe looking out five years. And, uh, so the recommendation that's coming before you takes all in, into account. Okay. Any other this comments? is Steve. This is Steve. Can I make one other comment uh, relevant to that? The last five years I've been on, the balance has basically continued to go up almost with with a with a reduction. And I think part of that is the value, the asset value has grown of the plan, which causes uh, contributions to go up into the fund. So. We've had a down here the last year, and it looks like your projection is based on, you know, 12.8 billion in the 401k, which it was a good bit higher than that even a year ago. So hopefully this will be a conservative projection, and we'll still end up with a higher balance at the end of three or four years than showing at the current rate. Steve, that's a great point. And in addition to that, uh, the staff that's sitting here, they don't get enough credit for this, but uh, they're continuing watching the paintings and paper clips to drive down administrative costs. So it's not just the revenues that are coming in uh, based on increased asset values and increased interest rates on the float, uh, but it's also a staff who is uh, constantly driving to down uh, both administrative and investment costs inside this plan that's giving us uh, this this opportunity. And I'll also add that uh, if we are ever successful uh, in getting a 401, 457 match uh, for our state employees, even if it's $50 a month, uh, that will that will balloon uh, the assets under management, in my opinion. It will balloon, I think Nels agrees with this possibly, it will balloon our participation rate by state employees, uh, and which will result in more money under management, which will result in more uh, fee earnings. And so I was not able to get that in the budget this year. It's a $50 per month participation, uh, a match on, on the uh, teasers. Uh, the elder, most of the, a lot of the elder employees already do, employers already do this. And as you know, there's a 50% gap between the elder employee participation rate and the teasers. Uh, elders people are 50% more likely to participate in, a, in their 401 and 457, which really puts them in a position to be retirement ready, which is all of our goals. Uh, but uh, just a $50 contribution uh, estimate with 75% of the people taking advantage of it is a $138 million recurring. And so it's just that's just the enormity of how many people are in this system and that's at fifty dollars a month not a percentage of pay just fifty dollars a month that's 138 million bucks so uh i'll continue to work on that uh going forward so uh we have a motion and a second on the table any further discussion okay uh staff thank you for all you did to uh, put this on the table and with that i'll uh clerk will call the vote trevor falwell aye Shabella Thomas. Aye. Lorraine Johnson. Aye. Wyndon Himmler. Aye. James Lumsden. Aye. Greg Patterson. Aye. And Nels Roseland. Aye. Next, we're going to uh, go over our 23 24 budget proposal. Yes. So uh, I have included two, two budget proposals in there, depending on whether we passed the fee reduction or not. So we'll be looking at the uh, at the budget version, which has our fee at um, one basis point. Um, you'll see from that that, excuse me, in the fee 100 basis points. Oh, okay. our, our administrative fee is one basis point. Okay. We just approved that. All right. Um, 
as uh, Steve had as Steve had pointed out, uh, our balances in the plans as of uh, March of this year, we had 12.8 billion in the 401k, 1.7 billion in the 457 for a combined of 14.5 in both plans. For purposes of this budget, we did not did not uh, did not uh, forecast any uh, any uh, any growth in assets, um, especially over what we saw last year. Um, we do have eight eight million in our reserves. Um, those reserves are invested in the stable value fund, so there's uh, there's interest that accrues on that. One change from last year is um, our assistant general counsel for SRP is now only 75% allocated to the 401k and 457 plan. The other 25% is allocated to the investment management division as he does provide services to that group as well. Um, also, the supplemental the retirement plan team uh, provides services to the NC ABLE program. As a result of that, the NC ABLE program will reimburse the plans about $107,000 for this for this fiscal year. And, and in the memo or or, or um, in the budget document, you can kind of see the the amount of time uh, from staff that's allocated to the ABLE program. Um, on the on the next page, you can see in the in the in the revenue projections uh, where our um, where a reserve balance is as what we estimated to be as of July first of this year. Uh, the estimated fee collection of the one of the one basis point that we would collect during the year. Uh, the estimated interest that will be credited based on the reserve balances, the subtotal, and then we have what we project through through our budget, and then what we project to have as our ending the reserve balance at June June 30th, 2024. And then on the final page, you can see the actual uh, the actual expense budget we have. Uh, the major changes there, um, we did uh, put in um, a legislative increase for staff. We put that in at the 4.25%, which was put forth by the House. We know the Senate has put forth a lower rate. We expect that will probably come in at a lower rate, but we left it at the higher rate for this, for this exercise in case it uh, does remain at that higher rate. Uh, there was also... Um, uh, a change in our proxy voting services for about for about twenty thousand dollars in terms of an increase, and then you'll see two two of sizable decreases. One, um, as you all know, we hired a new a new auditor. Uh, those expenses are going to be about thirty five thousand dollars less year over year from the prior prior engagement. And then also, we did not renew the diligent software, which we used to use for this for this board meeting. As a result, we'll save we'll save another fifteen thousand dollars a year by not having that. So when you look at the budget all told, um, and looking at a year over year, we have a slight decrease of about seven thousand um, dollars in this budget. Also, want to point out that uh, we do have some buffer built into this budget if things were to change, uh, and you can see that uh, for this past this past fiscal year that will end in June of this year, we expect our actual expenses to be about 1.7 million dollars. So again, there is a buffer built into this budget as we would you know, don't want to have to come back and ask and ask for more money. So that's why we built we we built in that buffer. I'll pause there and see if there's any questions about the proposed 2023-2024 budget. Uh, this is Shavella. I, I just want to make a comment. I was I was I was, I was glad to hear you um, say about the the um, raise piece because I was going to ask that question. Was that included here? It's so teeny I can't hardly see it. But anyway, 
I'm glad to, glad that there is that piece is a part of this budget. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yeah, uh, this is Steve. I have one other question. Yes. If you look at uh, page three, where it projects the interest earned of $184,000 in the 401k for the, for the stable value fund crediting of the, of the uh, float, so to speak, have, can't, could we consider another option that stable value fund? Could we use an institutional money market fund that would be paying about twice that right now? Or do we have to use the stable value fund? Because you can get 5% on an institutional money fund that's liquid and insured treasury wise. I'm just curious. I don't know if that's an option or not. That's a, that's a great question. And I don't know that answer sitting here today. Reed, I don't know if you know. We can look into that. I mean, probably something that be my ballot, but we can, we can look into that. Yeah, and you know, Steve, as you are, as you well know, uh, you know, the stable value funds tend to lag a little bit, and so yeah, it would be something that we can look into and see if that's an option for us. Uh, and we'll, and so we will do so, um, and we'll bring that back to the next, the next board meeting. Yeah, I mean, if if, if it's an option, you could always move it back if rates change significantly a year from now to stable value. So that's a possibility. Absolutely. Thank you, Steve. Any other questions about the budget? Okay. I'll make a motion we approve it. Steve. Make well, it, please. I'll send it. Oh, it's Shavella second. <laughs> Shavella, you're the Susan Lucci of the something on retirement board today. But All right. Well, <laughs> she eventually won a big, big award, which you're going to, before the meeting's over, I'm going to make sure that happens. <laughs> All right. Motion second being made. Any further discussion? Uh, hearing now the clerk will call the roll. Treasurer Falwell. Aye. Wyndon Himmler. Aye. Nels Roseland. Aye. Bob Shea. Aye. Greg Patterson. Aye. James Lumsden. Lorraine Johnson. Aye. Thank you. And, uh, after the meeting's over, somebody can explain to our our interns who join us, Gray and Gray Sun, uh, and Susan Lucci is. So. Uh, <laughs> uh, next, we're uh, on to our BNYM contract renewal. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so at our uh, Q3 meeting of 2022, the board approved uh, the staff the staff's recommendation to align the remaining term of our BNY Mellon contract. Uh, with that of the the investment management division, investment management division, which we did, and so as such, our current contract er ends in June of 2023. Um, the IMD group is going to uh, sign up for another another a two year renewal. Um, we are looking to do the same, and so the staff's recommendation is that we. Uh, we sign up for a two-year renewal with BNY Mellon. Okay. Any questions? Savala, would you like to make a motion? Yes, sure. I move that we accept this report. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Motion being made. Second. I'll second. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any further discussion? Uh, I will say before we vote that um, and Nels knows this as well as anybody, there are contracts and then there are contracts. There are some things where you can get a, a, a lot of people could do the business and then there's some things where it's just down to less than a handful of people that can do the business. So I uh, appreciate staff working with uh, BNY Mellon uh, to uh, get this to this conclusion and uh, look forward to our continued relationship with them. I guess what I'm trying to say is changing something like this is not a, ever an easy thing. And uh, 
so I'm glad we're able to continue. And given that, uh, we have a motion second on the floor. Clerk, call the roll. Treasurer Falwell. Aye. Lorraine Johnson. Aye. James Lumsden. Aye. Greg Patterson. Aye. Bob Shea. Aye. Steve Bean. Aye. And Wendon Hibbler. Aye. Thank you very much. Uh, we're now to legal matters. And one item uh, to mention to the board before we uh, get into the items on the agenda. It's just want to let you know there's a proposal in the, in the General Assembly to amend the open meetings law to require um, a quorum of members to attend a, a meeting in person, except when a state of emergency has been declared by the governor of the General Assembly. Um, and if the proposal becomes law, that, uh, that would mean at least five members of the board would need to uh, attend the meeting in person. Uh, in addition, if any member of the board attends uh, by phone or computer, then we would need to amend our meeting notice and um, uh, to state that the meeting's being held remotely and we would need to provide a, meet, a reason for holding the meeting remotely. Uh, the proposal allows a board member to attend a meeting remotely only in two situations, and that's if the, if the, uh, the board member is prevented from attending by either one, a health condition, or two, generally unexpected circumstances. So the bottom line is that a remote meeting would be defined broadly to include a meeting where even one board member uh, attends by phone or computer. The permissible reasons for conducting a remote meeting are limited to, to those two situations I I mentioned, and, and finally, even if a meeting is held remotely, a majority of members still must attend in person. The staff just wanted to, to bring that to your attention. It, 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 the bill that was in didn't make crossover, but that proposal may, it, it, as you know, may appear in another uh, in another bill at some point. So we'll keep you posted on that. But um, any any questions? Yeah. Um, at the, moving on to the board charter, at, at the February meeting, um, staff proposed changes to the to the um, the detainment review of the governance policies. Proposed some uh, amendments, um, including to the board charter. And as part of considering that the uh, changes to the charter, the board discussed term limits uh, that apply to board members and how to address a situation where you have a member who has served beyond those term limits uh, pending an appointment of a replacement. Uh, just, and it, as you may recall, the discussion acknowledged that at times there's a tension between the term limits and holdovers, um, specifically permitting a, a member to serve beyond, um, to, well, to serve beyond term limits until a replacement is appointed. Um, as a result of that discussion, staff went back to the, at, at the request of the board, went back to the board charter, um, revised it further, and uh, the proposals in your meeting uh, materials today. The changes to the current charter are tracked, and the revisions balance the tension between term limits and holdovers in two ways. First, it requires uh, staff to provide a written request to the appointing authority uh, to name a replacement when a member becomes term limited and to renew that request every every six months if the appointing authority has not acted. And second, by permitting a member to remain on the board pending appointment um, of a replacement notwithstanding term limits. So the proposed changes to the charter acknowledge that the board cannot Appoint a replacement, as, as the board discussed, as we discussed at the last meeting. Um, nor can the board control whether an appointing authority uh, appoints a replacement in a timely manner. Um, so, in, in light of balancing those two, um, balancing that tension, you have the proposal in front of you um, that I think is consistent with the discussion the board had uh, at the last meeting. And there are also several other other changes which were in the um, which were in the proposed amendment last term to update some of the language, bring it in, make it consistent with the board's actual practice. 
So the staff recommends the approval of what you have uh, amended in your board materials, but, uh, but are there any questions about the proposed changes? Hearing none, uh, we, this is an action item. Do I hear I'll a motion? make a motion to approve it. Steve again. Thank you. Second. I'll second that. Motion to say being made. Any further discussion? Hearing none, clerk will call the roll. Treasurer Falwell? Aye. Chevella Thomas? Aye. Wyndon Himmler? Aye. Lorraine Johnson? Aye. James Lumsden? Aye. Greg Patterson? Aye. Bob Shea? Aye. Great. Uh, next is uh, uh, amendment uh, regarding uh, 401k compliance issue. The next item is retroactive plan amendment to address a compliance error by one of our um, participating employers. Normally, when we have a, a compliance error, it's small enough that we can address that. We don't need to bring it to the board for uh, approval of anything. But um, from 2003 to 2020, um, Henderson County provided an employer matching contributions program in a manner that was inconsistent with their plan document, the 401k. Uh, and then the match program violated the plan document in three ways. Uh, first, there was a, a cliff or a threshold method where uh, for the employer match where uh, the employer contributed, if an employee contributed at least 2%, uh, of compensation, or uh, what we'll see is what they define as compensation, um, the employee the employer would provide the 2% match. Um, if you contributed less than 2%, you didn't get anything. And uh, the 401k plan generally requires all employees to be treated equally in regards to receiving employer contributions. Um, second, the county aggregated contributions across three different defined contributions plans to allow an employee to get to that 2%. So you would aggregate, they would aggregate contributions to the NC 401k plan, the NC 457 plan, and then the county sponsors its own 457b plan. Um, however, uh, per our plan document, as you might imagine, only contributions to the 401k uh, you know, should be used to, to determine the employer match. And then third, the county used a definition of compensation different from what we have in the 401k. Uh, the county limited definition of compensation to essentially to base standard base pay without taking into consideration um, overtime, bonuses, vacation payouts, those sorts of things. Um, that's the broader definition that we have in the 401k, which is consistent with the definition used in teasers and alligators. So staff worked with the county. Um, this arose in late 2019. Uh, staff um, and Empower worked with the county to correct the match program. They corrected it at effective April 1. And they're offering now a dollar for dollar match up to 2% of compensation using the plan documents definition of compensation, which is consistent with other employers who provide a, a percentage match. Um, however, given the, the extent of the error, uh, we needed to take the, the um, our, our proposed correction method to the IRS, um, pursuant to their voluntary correction program. Uh, so the proposal we made to the IRS was to limit the correction to essentially a go forward change, the county change what it was doing, and it's done that and bring it live with the, the plan document. Um, and that the, the, we as the administrator would adopt a retroactive plan amendment, very limited to cover essentially what the county did in 2003-2020. Notably, it didn't, our, our proposal did not include uh, uh, corrective payments uh, to employees or, or, or former employees because what we found was that the the county, this wasn't a situation of where, which we've had sometimes where an employer does not um, essentially fulfill the bargain it has 
omit some compensation, you didn't intend to do that, makes a mistake, right? There's a corrective, uh, corrective payment. In this situation, the essentially the county made a deal with employees that was outside of the plan document, but but employees received the, the essentially the benefit of their their bargain. So, kind of the balanced approach that we took to the IRS was let's correct this going forward, uh, but not require a corrective payment. Uh, our proposal was accepted by the IRS uh, uh, last month. So, the last uh, bit of uh, Clients work we need to do is to bring this, this the amendment you have in your materials to the board uh, or to adopt this retroactive plan amendment 2003 2020 that's specific to uh, Anderson County. So staff recommends the adoption of the amendment you have in your materials. But are there any questions? Questions? Okay. Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion. So I move. Second. 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 Thank you. Motion second being made. Any further discussion? Hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Treasurer Falwell. Aye. Chevella Thomas. Aye. Lorraine Johnson. Aye. Bob Shea. Aye. Nels Roseland. Aye. Steve Bain. Aye. And Wendon Hibbler. Aye. Thank you. Our, our next is uh, discussion item is amendment to our plan regarding beneficiaries. Staff has a proposal to expand the opportunity, for, uh, another proposal to expand the opportunity for beneficiaries to keep their monies in the plan, plan at, least to, at least to have that option to do it. As you may recall, the board expanded um, opportunities for beneficiaries in December um, by allowing beneficiaries to name their own beneficiaries if they wanted to, if they kept their money in the plan. Um, staff has a, um, the, the proposal in front of you is to allow uh, beneficiaries to keep their money in the plan, regardless of the number of beneficiaries named by the participant. So currently if a, if a um, Beneficiary can keep uh, his or her money in the plan only if he or she is a sole beneficiary. So, for example, if a participant names two individuals as beneficiaries, they're required in the plan document to roll that money out of the plan to take a lump sum distribution. Um, the attached amendments to the 457 plan, the 401k plan, would allow multiple beneficiaries to keep their money in the plans and it's consistent with what um, uh, a lot of other plans are doing. Uh, any questions? Okay. Hearing none, uh, I entertain a motion. So moved. I move we adopt it. Okay. Chevello's uh, got it and Steve is second. Uh, any further right. discussion? Here you go. Call the roll. Treasurer Falwell. Aye. Lorraine Johnson. Aye. James Lumston. Aye. Greg Patterson. Aye. Wendon Hibbler. Aye. Dells Roseland. Aye. Bob Shea. Aye. Okay. Finally, uh, the Glass Lewis, uh, as you probably know, is our vendor for proxy voting services. In September, uh, we signed a new five-year contract with the uh, retirement systems to continue uh, our relationship with Glass Lewis. And the, the fee, as it has been since at least 2017, is divided between SRP and the retirement systems based on actual usage. We provided notice, staff provided notice of the, of the contract at the, at the August board meeting last year. Um, and at the time, the, the contract didn't require the board's formal approval under the uh, vendor selection policy because the, the amount of the contract uh, was not expected to exceed the $25,000 threshold in the uh, vendor selection policy. Um, however, staffs recently amended the contract, uh, both on the retirement system side and the uh, supplemental retirement plan side, to cover Glass Lewis's proxy voting services for the shares held 
uh, and BlackRock's collective trust vehicles. BlackRock has last year provided an opportunity for customers to vote their own shares. Previously, those were voted by uh, BlackRock. Uh, the department has taken uh, taken advantage of that opportunity. And uh, as a reminder, all of the passive options in some of the retirement plans, except for the TIPS fund, are in BlackRock collective trust funds. The additional fee uh, is expected to take SRP's annual fee above $25,000. It's, you know, it's based on actual usage, but it's expected uh, approximately $10,500 extra, uh, raising the total annual fee to uh, approximately $30,000. As Jeff mentioned, we have $35,000 uh, in this year's budget. Um, and one piece of, one final piece of information uh, as part of BlackRock's product, uh, voting choice program, um, they would vote Glass Lewis's, they've loaded Glass Lewis's policies onto their system and they would vote this um, at no additional charge. However, given that you may be aware of pending legislative proposals regarding proxy voting, uh, the decision was made to keep the mechanics of proxy voting in addition to the uh, policy of Glass Lewis. Staff recommends uh, approval of the uh, contract with last. Any questions? questions regarding that? Was there a separate memo on this? I didn't see one. There was not. I, I did not have a memo on that. I, I'm glad to answer. But I'm glad to answer any questions about the uh, contract or the and the addition to it. Uh, if you'd like. Okay. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Thank you. Second. Thank you, Steve. Uh, motion second being made. Any further discussion? Uh, hearing now the clerk will call roll. Treasurer Falwell. Aye. Bob Shea. Aye. Mills Roseland. Aye. Shavella Thomas. Aye. Lorraine Johnson. Aye. James Lumpson. Aye. And Wynnett Hibbler. Aye. And uh, next is our, uh, that, that if you read the uh, Before we go to our next uh, panelist, I just wanted to, to offer that uh, it doesn't have to do with the our supplemental retirement plan, but some of you may have seen a story in the uh, in the news this week about the uh, the pension plan and and I want to just comment on what was in the story and that's all I'm going to comment on because uh, our our employee information our retiree information is confidential but I'll start with the fact that it doesn't matter how thin you slice something it still has two sides uh, as you can imagine uh, when we have a system here that has a million people on this pension, nearly a million people on this pension plan now, one out of 10 adult North Carolinians, there are things that happen. Uh, and sometimes the things that are happening are the result of the uh, employee themselves making mistakes that we that are not caught for a long period of time and it just compounds the, the issue. I will close my remarks about this by telling you that the thing that you read about this week and it happened in 21 years ago, uh, possibly, I think that's right, uh, as reported in the story. And uh, we discovered it uh, five years ago. And uh, my point of saying that to you is that uh, when this staff comes to me, with issues like this, it normally involves an underpayment or an overpayment, where we've underpaid somebody or a small group of people, or we've overpaid somebody. And when this was presented to me five years ago, time flies, Tom, uh, my 
philosophy, and this could affect the 401, the supplemental, as well as the test of pension, is that any time that we've underpaid someone as quickly as possible, get that money to them in full, period. <clears throat> and in terms of us overpaying someone, uh, that we look at what the laws say about uh, what we're supposed to do regarding these overpayments and that we be as compassionate as possible in, in effect in, in operationalizing the statute that the legislature has given us about how to deal with these issues. And that's exactly what we did. Uh, and I just wanted, I wanted to offer that explanation to you uh, and also say to you that in terms of underpaying people, that happens just like that. Uh, as far as overpaying people, I would say aggregately without speaking about any individual case uh, that they're based on the size of some of these situations and the life expectancy of some of these members uh, that we're talking about uh, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars that we never will collect. <laughs> And that's how we've dealt with it. Uh, paying people immediately when we underpaid them, being, taking the laws that we have to live under and with the maximum amount of compassion as we can when we're trying to collect money back uh, on behalf of the system. So I just wanted to, it's not on the agenda, but I, I know that uh, a couple of board members have mentioned it to me and I just felt responsible to, to give you that uh, brief explanation about uh, what's really happened and so that you can Paul Harvey standpoint here at the other side of the story. So, all right. So let the interns know who Paul Harvey is too after the meeting. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> sure they're already looking it up. Susan Lucci, Paul Harvey. There's your two homework assignments there. <laughs> well, good morning, everyone, and uh, thanks for that opportunity to be here. Uh, Mike McCann with the power, Matt Martin with the power. And uh, Mr. Treasurer, you say Paul Harvey and I instantly get a picture of sitting in my grandmother's house watching her smoke cigarettes and drink coffee with Paul Harvey in the background. It's a really good, nice childhood memory, actually. <laughs> what time of day was that? Probably like two in the afternoon. <laughs> and also the rest of the story. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that means she's still with us because you mentioned her today. Amen. Still here. Yep. Amen to that. Um, so for, for our update today, um, we want to make sure we provide an update on some of the key metrics for quarter one. Also provide an update for the migration uh, project. Um, Mr. Patterson being new to the board, um, about uh, 18 months ago, Prudential Retirement was acquired by Empower. So um, that um, project to actually now move the plans to Empower's record platform is going to begin in earnest. So I want to give just a quick update on that today. Um, so as, as I shared at the last meeting, um, the North Carolina plans are going to migrate over to the Empower Record Keeping platform in first quarter of 2024. Um, as we sit here right now, that'll probably be the first week in February, but could, it could also be the first weekend in, weekend in March, and we'll know more as we get uh, deeper into the project. That project is going to uh, officially kick off in June. And we're going to leverage a lot of the best practice learnings from the, the 403B project in terms of how we really connect with all of the sub plans um, on this effort. So what I, what I wanted to share today was really, um, you know, five, five things um, in terms of like when we kick this project off, um, five of the swim lanes in terms of how we're kind of viewing this project. The first is uh, enhancements. Uh, participants are going to um, see significant uh, enhancements as part of this migration to the Empower platform. As I shared last meeting, and I won't go into detail today, there's going to be um, some nice efficiencies and modernizations of the goal maker feature that's uh, a nice, important uh, feature in the program. There's also going to be opportunities to continue to engage with participants, especially helping participants when they are separated through service about the benefits of staying in plan or if participants are really seeking advisory solutions and really looking for help
when they might be getting approached by uh, a lot of the advisors and brokers outside of the plans. Um, so there'll be, there'll be some, some really nice features there that the board, if they so choose, can adopt. There's going to be a tremendous lift from a web capability and app capability. Um, the website that we have today, it's a very good, robust website. That, that website is going to be continued to be just as robust in the future. The huge lift for participants is going to be the app. The app that's in place today that you can put onto your, your Android or your iPhone, there's really three things that you can do on that, on that app. Power app, all the functionality that you could do via the web, you will also be able to do on an app. Um, complete, complete functionality on, uh, on either, either method that a participant would choose. There's going to be tremendous Spanish capabilities. Um, so, so for those participants that uh, Spanish is their first language, they can click one button and the entire website will, will, will translate into Spanish. And by also doing that, they also then can choose to get all of their, their confirmations and their statements also in Spanish with just one click of the button. We're also going to introduce Saturday call center hours for participants. And then most importantly, um, Jeff referenced that earlier today as you were talking about the, uh, the budget, the float process. Today with Prudential, that float process is actually an estimate of what we perceive that to be. At Empower, you'll be given the opportunity um, where that is actually your float. So we'll actually know that it's tied directly to the North Carolina plans and um, how that's invested in a cash account to determine what those float earnings are. So there'll be a lot more transparent in what that process is. Uh, the, second, the second swim lane, that's what, I, what, I, what I'm deeming is like just the migration experience changes. And that's really tailored to our, all of the sub plans that are part of the program. So as part, as part of the movement from the credential record platform to the Empower record keeping platform, we're going to engage with sub plans around making sure that they understand the changes in terms of like uploading payroll and the validation process to load that payroll. As we sit here today, it does not appear um, that any of the, the sub plans that submit payroll, either themselves or through their TPA, are going to need to change the formats of those payrolls. It's just the process of how they load that into the system will change. So there's going to be tremendous outreach and training on that. In addition, um, moving over from the Prudential platform to the Empower platform, today we have uh, robust security in place in terms of how sub plans um, get into our plan sponsor system to get all, run all the reports, load their payroll. We're going to use this as an opportunity to also make sure from a cyber fraud perspective that we've got really good validation in, in, in place as part of this project. So we'll be working with all the sub plans to just confirm their user authentication credentials. And then lastly, for the, for the sub plans, a lot of training is going to take place too on just the new plan sponsor website experience. There's going to be a lot more functionality out there as well compared to the Prudential experience in terms of um, reports that can be run, uh, getting a lot more granular detail about their, their participants. So that'll be all part of that training program as well. The, the, the third swim lane empowers embarking on a lot of builds to make sure that we can properly um, support the North Carolina plans being that you're such a large custom plan today. So we're, we're do, there's builds underway right now. Um, for example, um, like the, the, the law enforcement indicator, that's a big build that uh, we need to make sure we can also replicate on the Empower system. So that's builds taking on right now. There's a, a build in place to make sure that we fully comply with your loan policy. And then also a build taking place to make sure for those participants that are Bailey vested, that we can properly identify those folks on the Empower system and treat them accordingly when they make their distributions. And then the, the, the fourth swim lane is just differences in platform experiences. Um, so examples on that, it's just there's you know, different processes that we need to educate participants and plan sponsors on. Um, so one of those examples would be money out process. So uh, the required minimum distribution process, it's just slightly different in Empower. Uh, for example, they do it in a different month of the year than when Empower does it than when Prudential did it. So it's just those nuances and making sure participants are educated on those things. Other examples would just be the fun fact sheets. Empower uses a slightly different chassis 
uh, that looks like it's a little bit more robust from the first glance that I've seen on it, but we'll use that chassis to generate the, the fund fact sheets for your investments. And then on a lot of the, uh, the forms and the statements, they'll still be custom like they are today. It's just they're going to they're gonna look a little bit different with uh, the back end chassis that's used to generate uh, those statements and, uh, and all the forms. And then lastly, the, the last uh, swim lane is uh, in terms of the contract. Uh, rest assured, none of the, none of the uh, um, terms of the contract are changing today, but Empower uh, would like to do, to do an amendment of the contract just to reflect um, all of the uh, changes from one platform experience to the other, in addition to some of those, those optional features that I mentioned that you have the ability to, as a board to say yes or no to. So there'll be, there'll be that part of the project as well. So, so at, a, at a very high level, that, that kind of speaks to how our group is, is going to um, work with staff to manage this project over, over the course of the next uh, eight or nine months until we get, get to that migration date. Any questions there? And, all right. Uh, then really quickly, before, before I uh, turn it over to Matt for an update on uh, interaction with participants, uh, what, I, what I would just say, I'm, I'm really only going to stay on uh, a couple of slides. Slides. Uh, let's actually just stay on slide six today, in the interest of time. So, in terms of our overall goals, everything everything remains um, on track. Um, active monthly part contribution rate. We continue to set all time highs there. The active uh, participation rate. It remains high but we are slightly lower than our all-time high. That, that number's been slowly coming down over the last year, um, but still much higher than uh, historically where it's been for uh, about the last 10 years in that like 29 to 31 range. Um, but it's something that I think that we need to monitor. We actually had a meeting with, uh, with Jeff and Tom and their teams yesterday, and that could be an indicator of a headwind where the part like, the participation rate is slightly dropping because of some of the tough decisions out there that participants are faced with in terms of uh, inflation, interest rates, and, uh, and those sorts of things. So I think it's just something that we need to continue to monitor, but it's it's kind of a, a two-edged story where that's slight, very slightly down, but the average monthly contribution rate continues to uh, climb higher and higher. And then in terms of enrollments, Last year was a, was a record-setting year in terms of the new participants coming into the plan as well. Um, so with that, unless there's any questions for me, I'm going to turn it over to Matt for an update of uh, the interaction with participants throughout the state. Go ahead, Matt. Thank you, Mike. Uh, good morning, members of the board, staff. I'm pleasure to be here. Uh, welcome, Board Member Patterson. Congratulations on the appointment. I'm looking forward to working with you under your leadership and the rest of the board. Um, I'll take a few minutes today and I'll walk through our engagements so far through the year through first quarter, talk about some of the actions uh, Mike touched on. Um, just all in all, kind of to set the stage, I think a really strong start to the first quarter is, is our engagements. A lot of good feedback. Actually, right now, in fact, we're at uh, the tail end of our May campaign. It's a, a spring engagement campaign. Last year was the first time we did that campaign in May. We had really good response. This year, we decided to repeat it and actually expand it. We had 20 large statewide events uh, and then a lot of regional and local activities. So really good, uh, positive response. We're seeing really strong engagements uh, across the state with our 1,000 employers uh, and good feedback just overall. And I wanted to actually start and read a piece of feedback that we got from one of these sessions uh, in the first quarter. This came to us from a counselor. Uh, their HR contact of this employer on the eastern uh, part of the state sent it. It was right after one of the education events that we held. This employee sent a note to their HR manager and they wrote, I think you or possibly one of your staff may have originally sent employees a list of dates that offered us an opportunity to participate in a brief retirement training. Despite being far away from actually reaching that major milestone, LOL, I also knew that my learning curve on the subject was probably close to 100% because I've never been remotely familiar with the complexities involved around retirement. So I took advantage of the info provided and registered for the Roadmap to Retirement presentation. That training occurred today at noon by Mark McCluskey and his associate Margaret Hendershot. Wow! Exclamation point. 
it turns out that I was absolutely right about my estimated 100% learning curve because everything covered in the training was brand new to me. Needless to say, I had a huge takeaway. Mr. McCluskey was beyond impressive in his delivery, and Mrs. Endershot further complimented everything that got covered by adding links and other relevant information to the chat as the content got reviewed. I not only complimented them at the conclusion, but I also wanted, I felt compelled to circle back with you in HR to express my gratitude for fostering this entire learning opportunity. I share that um, because we get a lot of feedback like that. I think it re really reinforces the important role we play in connecting employees to education. Uh, it reinforces the program that this board and staff has created and all the different options we make available and how important all of them are. And I think the third thing it also kind of reminded me of is the important role of the employer. This employee knew about this meeting because their HR contacts sent out the information. So that partnership with employers across the state is critical. And uh, we're very thankful that they forwarded this on. So I wanted to share that this morning. A uh, strong start to the year. Uh, I'll spend a couple minutes on page 44 where you can see a breakdown of our education activity uh, year to date through the first quarter. Um, you know, I think kind of the sound, uh, the headline, the sound bite here is we continue to see the trends we've seen over the last couple of years with steady increases in our engagement. In particular, you'll see that with our group activity. Um, year to date through the first quarter, 542 group meetings. That's 23% higher than where we were last year at the same time. The attendees in those meetings, 11,788, that's 18% higher. We've also seen really strong engagement with uh, individuals in a one-on-one -on -one setting. We've had uh, 6,571 year to date. We're averaging about 2,200 per month, which is slightly higher than the monthly average last year. Uh, and I'll also uh, point out total on-site visits, 55 in January, 75 in February, 84 in March, If you go back to first quarter last year, we had 22. So 22 on-site visits last year compared to 214 this year. So not only have we seen strong increases in engagement in group meetings and one-on-ones, but we're actually getting out a lot more too, which is really interesting to see uh, the speed and the pace of that picking up. Right now we're at about a 75%, 25% split. 75% of our work is digital, uh, virtual, and then about 25% is face-to-face. Uh, and you know, we've talked in previous meetings, I think Christy Fairley and Zora have mentioned this, kind of this theme of meeting people where they are. That includes being flexible in how we engage. So we have web-based solutions, we have phone-based solutions, and then we also have face-to-face -face solutions that we're leveraging. So a hybrid model, uh, it seems to be embraced, but we're also picking up that on-site activity as well. Uh, the other thing I'll point out on page 44 is employer meetings. As we talked about earlier with that testimonial that I read, those employer relationships are critical. So we're meeting with employer contacts regularly. We've had 946 meetings year to date, uh, which is very consistent with what we saw last year. I would expect those numbers to increase as we get into the second half of the year, especially given some of the things that Mike just shared uh, about the migration work that we're working on. So all in all, good engagements. Uh, not listed on the page though, but really important work we're also doing in between group meetings, in between one-on-ones, we're doing outbound calls to retirees. Courtesy calls every day, every week, every month to make sure they know we're here to help them, that we can provide support, that they do not have to leave this program. And every day I get stories coming through. In fact, while we're sitting here, I got a text on one, another individual that we reached out to that was a law enforcement officer that's just retiring, was thinking about leaving, and we reached out and helped them and they actually have decided to stay in the program. So. Um, year to date, we've had over 1,400 of those calls, and that's something we continue to do as well. Uh, as far as actions, page 45, you'll see a breakdown of enrollments. Um, it's a rolling four-quarter view. Uh, first quarter on the very right there, 6,323 enrollments in the first quarter. That's the second highest first quarter since the beginning of this contract. Uh, last year, as Mike mentioned, was a record year for enrollments for actions we saw employees taking in this program, and we're seeing that trend continue uh, through the first quarter. It actually even picked up a little more in April and May. So really excited about seeing not just the engagement, but people taking action on the education we provide. Uh, and then finally, pages 46 and 47, still early in the year, but the actions of employees are important, but so too are the actions of our employers, not just working with us to provide education, connect employees to resources, 
but also getting employers um, to f consider adopting the 457 plan. They haven't done so. We've had several of those this year. Uh, employers adding contribution programs or enhancing contribution programs. You can see the breakdown on page 47 there. And then there are other optional features like adding contribution accelerator or moving from dollar-based contributions to percentage-based. So strong actions with employees, also with employers in April and May. We actually saw that trend line pick up. Uh, so we've seen a number of plans come in even uh, this month, in fact. Uh, looking ahead over the next 90 days, we will be wrapping up our spring campaign this month. I expect we'll see some really strong numbers that we'll be prepared to share at the next board meeting. Uh, we're also planning ahead. Last year, we did a first responders campaign in August. We want to repeat that this year. So we're planning out uh, some activity and some special focus areas we're going to do for the first responders, those on the front lines that serve. Uh, also planning a little farther ahead for National Safe for Retirement Month, which is October. Uh, but in parallel, continuing kind of our business as usual work, our group meetings, our one-on-ones, our outreach, uh, retiree webinars are a very popular session that we continue to do uh, every month. And then also, if we wrapped up the 403B discontinuation project last year, I think we saw some really uh, good partnerships built from that in the K-12 through space. We're continuing to reach out to those 115 school districts and also starting to get into uh, outreach calls to principals at a building level. So a lot of good stuff going on in parallel. And I'm excited about the future. It's still early. But there's a lot of work to do. And uh, excited to provide updates in our next board meeting. Happy to take any questions that you have. Questions for Matt. Thank you for all you're doing. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Next, we'll hear from Paul. Good morning, board members, treasurer. Uh, welcome, new member, uh, Greg Patterson, and staff. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to start with uh, slide six. Just kind of give you an update on you know where we are with uh, yields and whatnot so i provide this chart last quarter and you know just want to provide the update of the, the movement of interest rates and to show how the stable value funds crediting rate has moved over time in comparison to the fed funds rate uh, which we see there in fed funds effective rates in the light green the three-year uh, treasury yield uh, is uh, the, the blue blue and then the stable value composite blended yield um, net of fees is that dark green line and you know it, it just shows you know how much interest rates have moved over the last year uh, you know the, the question you know I heard earlier about uh, money market funds and where their rates are and you know they're, they're near five percent right now uh, but one thing to keep in mind is you know you know we take a look back at what rates were for money market funds maybe a year ago and I believe they were at roughly about 0.5%. And, you know, the Stable Valley Fund did provide net of fees uh, specific to North Carolina. I think it was about 1.67%, which three times higher. So, again, keeping in mind how, how, how money market yields have moved over time, uh, where, we are at, where we are at on, you know, the hiking cycle with the Fed, uh, you know, we might be close to the top. Uh, Again, we don't time interest rates, but you know, hearing what the Fed has talked about and then you know, the market kind of anticipating uh, future rates, uh, you know, maybe cuts to future rates. So, uh, just things to keep in mind there. Um, just wanted to also discuss, you know, we are in a pretty unique uh, interest rate environment with the yield curve, which basically, you know, is the rates that uh, you know people earn on, you know. Fixed income products, money market products, but basically the yield curve is in, in a normal, normal shape yield curve is upward sloping. So if you have on, you know, the Y axis, you have the yields and on the X axis, you have time uh, or maturity, you would expect to be paid, compensated more yield the further you go out. Right now it's inverted where the shorter rates because of the Fed action are higher than the, than the preceding longer term rates. That's really kind of thrown a wrench into into the market, uh, as you can see, you know, from 2022 when we saw a lot of, uh, you know, equities and uh, fixed income products uh, really got uh, struggle uh, with returns. But you know, the the one thing I'd like to point out of that is over the last 30 years we've only seen that happen roughly four times. So it is a unique environment. 
uh, you know, we'll see how, how it will last going forward. One interesting point to, you know, think about that inverted yield curve. If the market thought that that uh, yields on longer term, you know, thought that these rates would stay the same, we would have seen maybe a parallel shift of rates all the way up. So it'd still be a normal yield curve, but shifting all the way up. But it hasn't done that. It's become inverted. So the market might not be in tune with these rates being here for longer. Uh, but one thing that was asked to me was to, to kind of give a comparison between stable value and money market funds. And, you know, one of the things that, uh, you know, there was three points that I found that are pretty interesting, uh, you know, that provide benefit for stable value over money markets. Uh, number one, stable value has the ability to invest in longer duration securities. Uh, you know, and again, in a normal yield curve environment, investing further out on the curve, you get the higher yields. Uh, you know, in, in terms of North Carolina's uh, stable value fund, they have a weighted average duration of about 3.3 years. Uh, and, you know, they can invest even out to five years. So if we look at the three to five year bucket, North Carolina has about 25% of their assets in that bucket. They have 23% in uh, the bucket that's five years plus. But again, if you incorporate the, the, the STIP account as well, it comes out to a weighted average of 3.3 years. And you look at the comparison to money market funds, they can invest basically 90 days out to a year. So they're really constrained there. And again, they're taking advantage of that inversion of the yield curve where you're being compensated for higher yields on the short part of the curve. Uh, the second point, uh, money market funds are very limited in what they can invest in. Uh, namely securities issued by the U.S. government and its agencies like ultra short duration U.S. government securities, CDs, commercial paper, purchase agreements, or cash. On the other hand, stable value is able to invest in a diversified way across all investment grade sectors of the bond market that include treasury sectors, albeit with longer durations, uh, and non-treasury spread sectors, and that's where the yield enhancements are, like corporates, securitized investments like mortgage-backed securities, asset-backed securities, which really provide a much broader investment universe for stable value and more opportunity for enhanced yields, especially in a normal yield. Uh, and then third, due to uh, the stable values book value contract accounting, stable value contracts allow managers to invest in short to intermediate term fixed income securities, while also insulating participants from return volatility. Sure associated with market paper, which we did see in 2022, as I mentioned earlier, you know, as you know, we saw an increase in short-term interest rates. Uh, because of the stable value funds have historically delivered higher long-term uh, returns with similar or slightly less return volatility than money market funds. So in essence, higher long-term returns than money market funds with similar or slightly less risk in terms of return volatility. So in turn, you know, with these higher long-term return to risk measures, such as sharp ratios or information ratios, um, you know, the stable value funds, particularly are providing, you know, longer term, three, five, 10 year, or in the case of uh, state of North Carolina, 12.5 years, uh, which is the inception, uh, have provided at least a hundred basis points of, of additional return over money market funds. Uh, you know, in those long-term periods on a compound and nice basis. And I'll, I'll talk about uh, performance in a second. But, you know, that was a lot to digest. Are there any questions on kind of where yields are right now? Paul, I'm going to interrupt you. And maybe the next signature letter or something we should, because I get a lot of people asking me why we don't have a money market yeah. fund. So I think we probably should talk, I should talk more about that in the uh, next newsletter that goes out to our retirees. Sure. About that statistic you just gave. Yeah, we'd be happy to share any any insight. Uh, Can I ask a quick question? Sure, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, if rates remain inverted, if the yield curve remains inverted the way that it is, um, would you expect the stable value plan to lag money market funds? Well, it's it's you guys you can see on that that kind of slope there. It is catching up, albeit with the lag, because due to the book value smoothing of returns, where it's taking, it's taking, you know, the the underlying returns of the fixed income funds, which you know were negative in 22, which in turn had a you know a market to book ratio of under 100. percent So we're amortizing that loss, but on the flip side, we are also reinvesting at those five percent, you know, 
roughly yields. I think the yields we're investing at, again, we, we look at more of the three year range instead of you know the 90 day T notes to one year. Um, and they're about, I think the, as a 331, we're at about 4.8. So we're still investing at those. And again, all the every, you know, all else equal in terms of participants not pulling a lot of money out of stable value, we would expect it to reach that point. So if yields start coming down on the short end of the curve, you know, still stable value will still be, you know, increasing up because again, it has a lag before it comes back down. But you get two pieces, right? It's it's how quickly the Fed raised rates on the front end, right? And then the fact that it's an inverted yield curve that some of those other underlying fixed income managers typically go out a little bit farther on the curve, right? Yeah. Um, most of them have the ability to invest shorter as well, right? True, true. So yeah. that's where you're saying the, the underlying yield is, is almost 5%, right? True, true. And, and you know, the one thing we look at, so we have a cash component, uh, you know, that's 1% to 3%. Then we have a short duration component, which is roughly around 40%. And then there's an intermediate duration component. And that's where, you know, your external managers are. So they have a mandate to stay in that intermediate duration range. And the short duration range is about one to three years. So. Thank you. Okay. Uh, if we flip to the next page, page seven, um, really what I want to say about this page is, again, the state of North Carolina Stable Value Fund is doing exactly as intended in our current market environment. Uh, you know, we look at, you know, net asset value, $2.46 billion. Uh, that's roughly down from last quarter at the you know, 1231, 22 numbers, about down about 15.4 million or six tenths of 1%. Really, really uh, de minimis uh, uh, number out, out there. So really, again, it, it was due to mostly to about 30.4 million in net outflow from participants. Basically what they were doing is just moving money out of stable value into other options in their plan or not. Or taking money out of the plan altogether, but that was offset by 15 million in interest as well. Uh, the portfolio characteristics on the lower left hand part of the page: the three items. You know, the first three items are average quality book value. Those are the the book value wrappers. Uh, the there's been no change there uh, in terms of their financial strength ratings. The average quality, the underlying bonds that the stable value fund holds, still consistently strong at double A. The number of wrapper buyers is the same at five. Uh, the blended yield, as I was mentioning on the previous page, is still moving up. Again, it moved up about 33 basis points uh, to 2.53%. Again, it's following the path of interest rate, interest rates uh, with a lag to that book value smoothing of returns. Uh, and again, the yield to maturity you see right there. And again, we're we're at that weighted average of around 3.3 years. Uh, you know, it's, it was 5% last quarter. It's about 4.8%, uh, you know, this quarter. And again, I, I took a look at, again, 91 day T-bills, uh, you know, provided by the Fed as of March 31st, it was about 4.85%. And three years, CM, uh, constant maturity treasury is about 3.81. So even between the 91 day T-bill, you know, and the three year constant maturity treasury, we do see an inversion where it's higher on the low end than it is uh, in three years. Um, the uh, market to book ratio, you know, ha happily we've seen that come back. Uh, and again, that's due to the positive underlying fixed income returns that have helped push this up. And as I mentioned in the past previous quarters, we are not concerned that this number is still below 100%, given that this is solely due to the Fed rising rates on the short end of the curve. Um, and not a credit event, which we saw for the great financial crisis in 2008. Uh, and again, benefit of stable value is again, providing positive returns, even when the underlying fixed income returns are negative by that smoothing of book value returns, which again, incorporates those two things, the amateurization of the market book deficit, and the reinvestment at near 5%. Any questions on this page? Okay, go to the next page. We got performance, uh, net of all fee performance. Uh, and really what I want to, you know, stress here is again, you know, I'll incorporate my thoughts about money market funds and where they're at as well. So we see that top line, the green, green bar for the state of North Carolina net of all fees. And again, I, you know, I like to focus on, you know, kind of long-term numbers because that, that is really, you know, kind of the proof in you know, long-term uh, success for this, this option. I got, you know, the three month and one year 
have uh, you know have uh, looked comparatively like they're they're not doing as well as the three year cost of maturity. But again, that's solely due to interest rates rising and the lag of stable value fund matching that over time. So it, it will will be continually increasing um, as we see that net credit rate. But you know, I did take a look at um, you know let's say Morningstar's money market fund all taxable universe media. It's not listed on this page, but Really, if you look at that top line for a state of North Carolina, uh, you know, you see the three about that 61 basis points, uh, the, the return for Morningstar uh, that all taxable universe mean was about 1.12. One year, 207 for North Carolina, 232 for, for uh, you know, the Morningstar universe. Uh, 2% for three years. This is where it becomes important. 2% for three years for, for North Carolina participants. 0.79% for money market funds, 2.18% uh, five years, 1.13% um, at first money markets, and then 206 for 10 years, 0.65% for money market fund universe median. So again, that, you know, those three periods, three year, five year, 10 year, 121 basis points of outperformance, 108, 105 basis points of outperformance, 141. So again, the question becomes, when does the bond market believe that these high short-term rates will last with the yield curve being inverted as it is? So my guess, you know, is not, uh, you know, it, it's not going to stay this way. Um, as I mentioned before about the yield curve and being, you know, kind of flat on those longer, uh, you know, those longer maturity, uh, those longer maturity, uh, you know, duration pieces. So Again, so, uh, you know, if we take a look, uh, you know, even at that ICE, that third item there, the ICE Bank of America, U.S. three-month Treasury Bill Index plus 150 basis points. Again, that was supposed to be a rough comparison of what a 91-day T-bill, 91-day uh, T-bill plus 150 basis point bogey would be as a relative quasi-comparison for what a stable value fund should do. And again, you know, as I mentioned with straight what money market uh, universe medium re returns were, you know, it's still, you know, that that's really playing out. You know, it's, it's around that 100 to 141 basis point uh, outperformance there. So um, any questions on this page uh, in terms of performance, relative performance for mar money market funds? I really think that the, the thing to look at, again, is the long term performance, then just take a look back at what money market yields were a year ago and you know they've been low for long for a long time and they may not come back to that 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 level going forward but you know do we think that the yield curve is going to stay inverted as it is given it's only happened four times in the last 30 years thoughts there um you know all, in terms of time if we could turn to page 11 kind of a, the contract issuer page Again, really consistent numbers across the board here. Uh, you know, the, the one thing I'd like to point out though, uh, you know, in regards to the banking issues, the regional banking issues we've heard of recently uh, among these regional banks, uh, we don't believe the RAP providers uh, in the state of North Carolina, Stable Value Fund, or any of our 10 approved RAP issuers will, will have an effect uh, in, in our opinion of their, of their financial strength ratings. Uh, you know, one thing, you know, that may take a hit for these uh, insurers. Uh, you know, it, it's the same as the case of office real estate, their investments in office real estate. Uh, then it may take a hit to their earnings, but we don't believe it's gonna take a, any effect to their actual financial strength ratings. Um, so, and you know, specifically about regional bank exposure, uh, you know, in terms of the state, state of North Carolina Stable Value Fund, they had no exposure to the Silicon Valley Bank or SVB as it's uh, the, Initials, Signature Bank, SV, uh, First Republic Bank, and Western Alliance Bank or, uh, prior to the collapse of you know, Signature Valley Bank or Signature Bank. So, again, we, we invest in the highest quality names. And, you know, these regional banks were uh, not in our investment guideline uh, to, to invest in. Uh, one, one other question that was brought up is, too, uh, you know, what's the exposure to credit suites? 
Credit Suisse, uh, we had, uh, the state of, state of North Carolina, state of Black Fund had no exposure to Credit Suisse. The AT1 or alternative tier bonds uh, that were ultimately wiped out, um, but did have a very small 0.19% uh, or 19 basis points of exposure to senior debt uh, as of uh, the end of February. So really de minimis uh, exposure to Credit Suisse. Uh, and one last note on this page, as well as I mentioned last quarter, Metropolitan Life uh, separate account, insurance company separate account, uh, is in process of moving to Met Tower uh, to match the other contract types there, the synthetic GIC. And we, we, this is move, moving smoothly with uh, Bank of New York Mellon and uh, and with Met, uh, Met Life and Met Tower. Um, and we should have that completed by the end of this month. Fees will go from 17 basis points down to 15 basis points. Uh, the Met Tower rating will have the exact same uh, uh, financial strength rating at double A minus as MetLife does. And, you know, most importantly, there'll be no impact in the daily trading of participants. So those were the items I had up in this page. Any questions here? Okay. Uh, just in the essence of time, move to page 15. Uh, fee page, uh, you know, really fees for the first ending of the first quarter 331 uh, 23 were exactly the same as they were 12 31 22 um, again since the beginning uh you know again in the january 1st of 22 we have seen fees come down from let's say 0 0.293 percent to 0 point or 0.275 percent which was about a 6.1 percent drop but again that also incorporated the uh, administrative fee moving uh, down as well. Uh, but if we took that part out, uh, you know, that movement out, it, it did drop about 1.9%. So, and again, that was due to uh, the state of North Carolina stable value uh, MFN status from the fee drop on the 1st uh, of January 22. So, you know, good news there uh, to see that fees are still moving in that right direction. Any question on fees? Oh, will, will this see the full uh, full a two basis point reduction when that rat fee changes. Next quarter, yeah. Because yeah. uh, again, we're we're trying to get this complete by the end of May, you know, this month. So you know, by June thirtieth, we should see you know in that investment contract. Or I'm sorry, yeah, the investment contract fees. The reason why it looks like fifteen basis points there is because it's a weighted average that includes all assets, even the, the short term investment fund. So we should see that come sub sub fifteen then in the fourth quarter. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about, uh, page 19, just kind of how the underlying performance of the fixed income investments have done. And really happy to report, again, as we saw in the fourth quarter, uh, we do see positive performance for that three-month period. Uh, you know, as we saw, you know, that all of the underlying managers have provided meaningful long-term outperformance uh, from their benchmarks. Uh, really, you know, kind of you know, summarizing what really helped this quarter, overweight allocations to, to corporate securities really drove performance across the board as, as spreads tighten. Um, you know, general overweight to the middle of that, the component of the yield curve, that three to five, three to seven year uh, was beneficial to returns. Uh, detractors really were security selection and, and agency residential mortgage-backed securities, agency mortgage-backed securities, and commercial mortgage-backed securities. Again, with that theme of real estate uh, detracting for, for the quarter. So, uh, and really being longer duration than the underlying benchmark was additive to returns, while being shorter duration than the benchmark was a detractor. So with that, you know, the, those are the comments I had. Any questions on performance? Estimate. What impact does the, does the wraps have on the yields? If so on that net crediting rate, their fees are deducted from that number. Uh, so again, you know, that's that's roughly about 15 basis points. And really that's kind of the floor we've seen among all of our 10 approved contract issuers. We did see one new issue, uh, issuer come in in the December of 22, that was Citibank. Uh, I think they came in with kind of a teaser rate at 14 basis points, but again, you know, it, they're new to the new to the wrap market. You know, they're not as experienced as the other providers. You know, 
is it worth, is it a thought for us? If we are evaluating them, they're not one of our 10 approved, but really is the thought to move to 14, that, say that one basis points to go with that kind of you know, risk involved that we don't believe at this time it is. But really that, that, uh, that fee does come out of the crediting rate. Anything else? All right, team. Well, thank you very much. I've, I've got a question. Sure. Uh, yeah, this is Steve. Um, let me make an observation, an observation after that. Um, given the magnitude of these rate increases the last year plus, I think the, the Stable Value Fund has really done exactly as we would have expected it, so I understand that. Um, but my question or observation is that this is the greatest magnitude we've seen in 40 years since the 79-80 period with Paul Volcker raising interest rates. And um, have institutional investors, your investors, are they considering changing any behavior with stable value funds because of the big disparity in interest rates now between short and and these? Has that caused some of them to start looking at their contracts and? deciding if they want to have more flexibility. Um, I'm just curious if that's come up in discussion, Paul. You know, we, we have heard of clients asking, uh, you know, about, you know, money market funds and, you know, participants asking about money market funds, but really the, the thought about those is really, you know, what is, what is the purpose of the stable value vehicle? And again, it's a, it's a long-term investment vehicle. Again, we could, you know, you can try to chase those rates if you'd like, but, you know, the thought is with money market funds, you know, is there a thought that that's going to stay? And, you know, we, we've seen really low rates in money market funds for quite a long time before this, almost to the point where money market fund providers were eating the fees, their, their expense ratios or their management fees, just so that they could have a positive return. Uh, so... Do we, you know, one other thing that I've seen, you know, kind of, you know, in the in the market too is you think about your your savings accounts and your banks. You see what they are charging for interest there, and that's, you know, one to five basis points. And I think, you know, there there should be, you know, a thought for banks. You know, if rates stay high on the low end like they are, you know. Investors are moving money out of their savings accounts at banks and just putting them into treasuries or money market funds. And that's providing somewhat of a liquidity squeeze at banks right now. So I think the solution to that would be banks need to maybe think about you know, keeping assets in their in their banks and maybe think about raising rates on those savings accounts. And, and also, you know, again, that, that's going to hurt their bottom line. But having a liquidity crunch in banks is not uh you know something that's that that is a good thing so again that could move to more quantitative easing and actions by the fed so really kind of want to steer away from that but uh in terms of the clients at galliard especially this stable value separate accounts we have not had any clients move to, to money market funds because again these questions came up in 2017 2018 when interest rates went up uh, you know, and again, that the rates came right back down after that. So it's almost kind of a uh, chasing the market as you will. But again, we, we look at stable value as a long-term investment vehicle. Uh, and, and we look at it in the terms of investing in a normal. Uh, and again, it's, it's in a unique position right now. And I guess the question becomes, how long do you think it's going to last given that it's only happened four times, as I mentioned, and yeah, the biggest change was what, as you mentioned, back in the early 80s with Volcker. Does that help answer your yeah. question? Uh, yes. Uh, one other question or comment, though, is we've seen a sea change of uh, attitudes with the banks, for example, SPP and Signature, where overnight you could move all the assets out on your iPhone, basically. And they had a liquidity crunch. Has that changed the thought process and dynamic in, in institutions that they're 
if we're going to be able to see this kind of movement in money so fast. You know, I just I just think that's an interesting perspective that probably is not the genie is not going back in the bottle. Again. Yeah, in terms of yeah, Signature Valley Bank, you know, I think there was a mismatch between their assets and liabilities. You know, they were investing way out on the curve, and you know, their you know when when rates happened the way they did, you know, they they were had a had a paper loss, uh, not a not a because they didn't trade on the securities, but you know, once the money started. You know, the th whispers out there that there's going to be a run on the bank, everybody pulled their money out. So they ended up having to sell the securities at a loss. And that just kind of catapulted it. Um, again, in terms of how that affects, you know, the state of North Carolina stable value fund, you know, I, I mentioned we didn't have any exposure to those those type of banks. Um, and Signature Valley Bank it had a really unique uh, investor uh, investor makeup where it was a lot of venture capital firms and areas in the, you know, people near the Silicon or Silicon Valley area. And, you know, that's, you know, the, and yes, they could take their money out at any time, but we, we invest at Gallier, we invest in the highest rated banks. You know, we have, a, you know, that's, you know, JP Morgan, you know, the, the type of banks that, you know, are, you know, the, the SIPI banks, the, the ones that are you know, too important to fail. So while while there are issues in those smaller banks, we don't take the risk in investing in those. So we're pretty insulated from activity in, the, in those those type of investments. Thank you. Anything else, Steve? Nope. Thank you. Just want to remind everybody, uh, one of my other 20 hats is I chair the State Banking Commission, and we've been deeply involved in the First Citizens takeover of Silicon Valley Bank. And I've asked to be a fly on the wall when the people in San Francisco realize that the people from Eastern North Carolina might talk with accents, but we don't think with one. Uh, I would like to be a fly on the wall when those two cultures come together of San Francisco and Eastern North Carolina. But uh, I'm sure they won't be talking about barbecue. So uh, <laughs> should be talking about risk oversight. I know. Uh, but uh, uh, and Steve, just to put a little bow on this, 90 percent, 90 percent of the depositors of Silicon Valley Bank were uninsured. Wow, 90, not nine, 90. <laughs> yeah. And that's why our banking system in North Carolina, our state chartered banking system, is so secure. With Three big leaders of PBT Truist, First Citizens, and uh, First Bank are the three big three of the thirty six that we regulate here in North Carolina. So, thank you very much. Hey, my pleasure. Thank you. All right. Next. See, might be a break. Can we roll on? Roll on. Mr. Treasurer, members of the board, uh, I'm Weston Lewis from Callan, joined by Elizabeth here. Uh, we're going to discuss the results of the, the uh, options and the plan plans, as well as discuss uh, some other things. Elizabeth is going to go over our annual update on uh, administrative fees and, and talk through uh, what has changed over the last year with that. As always, I'll give a quick update brief update on what happened in the capital markets and help contextualize some of that performance. But, you know, while we were discussing rates, uh, you know, th that seems to be the dominating theme occurring within markets right now. And I, Betty, I'll maybe take you to page one of our, our report here. Uh, rates and, um, and, and really, you know, the curve yields. Uh, are having an effect on equity markets, fixed income markets, just all markets seem to be uh, encapsulated by what's happening happening within rates. We went from the Federal Reserve went from zero to 5% uh, in nine hikes in the span of a year, which we have down as the fastest in history, fastest uh, rate increases. Uh, that, as we just discussed, brought up some, you know, made some cracks appear uh, in, within the banking system. Uh, investors, you know, how this affected 
equity markets as investors seem to favor growth stocks over value stocks. Uh, financials really you know, pulled back hard post March after Silicon Valley uh, and um, Signature Bank both uh, effectively failed. So, what we saw kind of with investors favoring growth stocks, that was a trend reversal from what has been happening over the past nine months to a year. Um, just a lot of questions that we're getting as we go around and talk to clients as well, you know, you've got it on the banks, but what about our own, uh, you know, debt ceiling? What, what happens in, in the case of a debt ceiling default? Um, right now, the equity markets and, and really the bond markets are viewing this as a non-event. It doesn't appear to be priced in. Equity valuations still remain high um, and really you know, have not been pulled back in anticipation of, of some major collapse of, of our our own system. And, and the last time, I want to say it was 2011 or 2012, is when this debt ceiling uh, was tested the last time and the S&P downgraded uh, the U.S. Treasuries or the U.S. debt. Um, actually, there was a flight to quality where the instruments got downgraded and investors wanted more, demanded more Treasuries. So that uh, when you are the World's reserve currency, you get that, you know, that benefit to where when you know, there is a flight to quality event, uh, people want more dollars and they want more treasuries. So we'll see how it plays out this time. And non-US <laughs> and non-US markets uh, on the next page, similar themes, growth, uh, outpacing value. Another theme that has been uh, really evident over the last several years, oh, maybe even over a decade, is the dollar strength relative to other currencies. Uh, so far in 2023, also towards the end of uh, 2022, uh, that dollar strength has been tested and other currencies are beginning to gain ground on the dollar. What this means to non-U.S. investors is that, uh, that you know, as you, if you were to look at non-U.S. versus U.S. returns on local currency terms, the difference has not been as stark when you look at it on U.S. dollar. U.S. has outperformed non-U.S. by a significant amount. Without that dollar strength, um, which we think is that dollar strength continuing is unlikely to, to uh, occur. So, um, you know, it could be a tailwind to more non-U.S. stocks on a go-forward basis. And finally, on page three, in fixed income markets, two key themes, volatility, and what you all just discussed is yield curve inversion. Uh, there's something called the move index, which is a measure of treasury market volatility. Uh, it's spiked to the highest level uh, that we've seen since 2008, when there was a, a true kind of another financial crisis uh, occurring. Uh, so something that we are paying attention to. And then on the bottom right hand side, you see that uh, schematic of the, the yield curve and uh, it became the yield curve only became more inverted here uh, from the end of the year to the end of the first quarter. With that, I will jump to page five and just very briefly touch on uh, the assets uh, within the plans. This is an 401k as well as the 457. Uh, the assets increased to 14.6 billion uh, as of the end of March. This is uh, in terms of dollars that were gained from investment gains, uh, almost three quarters of a billion dollars uh, were gained over the quarter from, from the investments alone. And so you don't have to scroll back and forth about half of these assets are invested in Prudential's Goldmaker service. So as you think about uh, how are participants allocating dollars, a lot of what we typically like to see is more participants uh, using the do it for me option to where uh, the asset allocation is more professionally managed. And um, so to have 50% of the assets in this do it for me solution, we think is, is a good thing. 
on page six, we'll talk about performance of the options. This is how your participants see it. They don't see, uh, unless they dig in a little bit further, they don't really see the underlying individual managers. They see the options. So as we think about the, the four standalone offerings, there's a passive tier and there's an active tier. Uh, so in terms of the passive options, they're doing exactly what you hired them to do, which is track their respective indices at a low fee. Um, they're, you know, given what I mentioned in the volatility of fixed income markets, uh, there was a little bit more than what we typically see, some pricing differentials for the fixed income components. So that would affect the inflation response of the fund, as well as the fixed income passive. You'll see some little bit of tracking error there for the quarter uh, and still in line with expectations. Moving down to the active options, uh, you all have discussed the stable value fund. I will just mention, as, as we have a couple of times, that this looks at stable value in the rear view mirror, how really we think of more superior way to look at stable value is to look at the crediting, or crediting rate versus peers, as well as the market book versus peers. Uh, it gives a little bit more forward-looking uh, uh, look into how your stable value managers is doing. As it relates to market book, Galliard ranks in the top decile relative to peers. This is the one that you all have. And on crediting rate in the top quartile versus peers. So, uh, favorable results there. As you look in the rear view mirror um, returns over the last three, five, seven years, top decile performance relative to other stable value providers. Fixed income fund, uh, in line with expectations, I, I would just say maybe for all of these options, the four options, um, all four for the last quarter outperformed their respective indices. So trending in the right direction for some of these, uh, the fixed income fund, namely in the large cap core, equity fund, still some work to do over the last year and three year results, but uh, good to see some some improvement, though near term, we, we all know that a quarter does not necessarily make a trend, but it is, um, it can be the start of one. So, um, and then getting a little bit more granular on the individual managers, I'm going to jump to page 15. And maybe just to explain what we're looking at with uh, our what we call our stoplight pages here is Callan believes that people process philosophy that's what drives performance for the managers and the strategies and so um, while we do think performance is, is very important and ultimately an indicator of you know do you have these uh, right processes in place and do you have Know, the consistent process. Do you have a, a durable philosophy? Um, that's what we're trying to get at here. So we, we rank each category, the organization, the people, the process and philosophy, the, the performance. Uh, we give them a color code ranking, green meaning you know, in line with expectations really, and no issues. Blue being a little bit more noteworthy, but not something that we're, we're concerned about. No concerns. And then Yellow being noteworthy and, and something that we're actively monitoring. And then uh, the red is uh, highly cautionary and, and really something that we're concerned about and actively reviewing. To talk through what changed from this quarter's report, from last quarter's report, as you look at Macquarie here, a large gap value focus, uh, both the short-term performance as well as the long-term performance uh, triggered to the worst. Uh, a lot of that due to a very challenged quarter from Macquarie. They were 4.5% behind their index, which is maybe a little bit more uncharacteristic of them. Um, still in line with expectations. I should maybe show sure my words there, but 4.5% behind. We, we've seen much worse from one of your managers, Sands. But for Macquarie, uh, while they are active, they are typically not nearly as high tracking error as, as say, Sands Capital is. Uh, a lot of their detractors for the quarter had to do with stock selection in financials. Now, what they didn't own, they didn't own any Silicon Valley Bank, they didn't own Signature Bank, uh, to my knowledge, they didn't own First Republic. Uh, 
uh, they did own Truist and U.S. Bank, and both of those kind of got caught up in the in the headlines of being a, a regional bank, and uh, they have stuck with these holdings. They they think the outlook for these banks are actually uh, you know remain positive. So um, something that we're you know, maybe a little bit more cautionary on is the actual personnel changes that have occurred over the past year uh, and, and really kind of beyond that. Uh, in 2019, one of the long-term founders of the strategy, Nick Levaney, retired. And then, you know, here more recently, uh, a, 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 an announced retirement coming up in July uh, for another uh, key professional there. But How long have we had this? How long have we had that? Uh, Macquarie, uh, you have had them, I want to say, over 10 years. Uh, 2015. 2015, eight years. Eight years. Now are we getting into a, a, a wedge situation here? No, we, we don't. We don't think so. Um, we are. Well, you know, our outlook did move to kind of our overall status there moved to more cautionary here a couple of quarters ago. Um, we Macquarie remains a, a tier one provider here in the, kind of the large cap value space. So no, they, they have not begun to lose assets like like which. And so would you say the biggest difference between between their performance in hot is in the same kind of mandate would be their stock selection and the exposure to those financials? Uh, that is correct. So, so Hotchkiss is going to be a little bit more cyclical. They're they're willing to to uh, purchase some of those lower quality names. Um, that has been a big benefit to Hotchkiss's style. Whereas Macquarie might be a little bit more quality oriented. Want to see you know more stable kind of business models. Um, and so, it, it's a good offset because the two pair well together. Uh, but but yeah. It, we should expect some performance differences between the two. They're, they're both doing their job. For so there's no large cap value index funds. Oh, there are. There are plenty. And how are these done in relation to those? So if we go to page eight, uh, I don't want to take us back because we're running late. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> anyway, I'll give this brief. Yeah. So as you look at Macquarie over the last year, three years, five years, they have under underperformed their respective inde index, which is the Russell 1000 value. Um, and uh, a lot of that has to do with what happened in the quarter. So given that four and a half percent performance differential, they gave back all of their own performance. So if we looked at this last quarter, they would have been ahead of their index this quarter. All those trailing results got dinged because of what happened during quarters. Okay. Yeah, and then Hotchkiss, uh, ahead of their index, well ahead of their index over the last three years, they're uh, eight percent better than their index. So um, that kind of annualized. Hits. Yeah, annualized. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. All right, and then um, on the positive side, on page fifteen. Uh, I'll just mention the Loomis sales large gap growth. This is meant to be your offset to SANS. Again, a, a more aggressive growth manager. Loomis sales being a little bit more quality growth. Uh, their performance, short-term and long-term performance, actually improved. Um, and so uh, moved from kind of that yellow marking to blue on both short-term and long-term performance. And then finally, just to mention SANS, uh, one of the things that we're paying attention to, and this is on page 16, the next page, is just how are assets holding up? Um, I mentioned uh, over the last quarter, the assets have remained fairly stable. Uh, they did start to see some outflows there in late 2022. Uh, however, the asset base remains stable. It's something that we're paying attention to. And, um, you know, remains a healthy, well over $12 billion managed in the strategy. So uh, very healthy uh, strategy in terms of assets under management. In the interest of time, that those were all the comments that I had on the managers. Uh, we can shift gears to talk about the 
the next item on the agenda, which is the Smith cap comparison. If you'd like to discuss that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so back in 2020, uh, November of 2020, this board voted to implement some changes uh, to the SMID cap or option. So we, we compare the prior structure versus the current structure. Uh, the prior structure, if I could characterize, had a little bit more of a value bias, and then we had two value managers, uh, both Wedge and Ernest, and then um, a growth manager with Brown. Uh, some marginal changes were made. We shifted Ernest to a core strategy that they, they manage. Um, and then uh, we also decreased some of the passive in, uh, within the, the option, recognizing that uh, this is meant to be an active option. The participants can choose from a fully passive option in the menu if that is kind of their, their philosophy. The good news here is that well, both structures have performed well over the last three years. Uh, the current structure has shown some, some value added, so uh, the timing was not um, disappointing here in terms of, of you all making that change. I know uh, we, we talked about value leading growth over the last two years, and, and really it, it has been a non-event in terms of looking at the past structure versus the current structure. If I could, you know, maybe just go to the next, and uh, well, I will highlight that on the bottom line here, 3% per annum added, value added uh, from the current structure, the prior structure, the old structure uh, that you move from has added 2.49%. And those are net of these, and these are annualized net of these over the last two years. On page two, just looks at this over time. So um, the gap did widen out a little bit more over the last quarter, given what I mentioned, value uh, underperforming growth, but really you know, going into the end, or sorry, the end of um, the year, the current structure still had a, a slightly um, relative to the old structure. And then on the page three, the, the risk statistics are a little bit mixed. Um, some reduction in uh, risk, um, depending on which definition of risk we're looking at, but um, tracking error slightly increased, but overall you're getting paid to take that additional tracking error risk. Any questions? I'd ask you all to put a mental pin on this because we will be talking about one of the managers later in the agenda. So I think it's important to remember again, participant experience is the whole option, which has been positive. So participants have not been you know, overall negatively impacted by one of the underlying managers that we're going to talk about. Any questions on performance structure and performance before we shift gears? I just want to add that it should not be lost on anyone that as you're hearing all these discussions about inflation and bank failures and this location of people pulling their money out of banks, putting in the treasuries. And the treasury is the one who's having to bail out the banks for people pulling their money out of the banks and putting them in treasuries. I mean, uh, it's, it's almost sad, but that's, I mean, the mechanisms and the behaviors that we have set up to work against ourselves and our citizens just sometimes just hit you right between the eyes, right? People pulling money out of banks to put them in treasuries. You have a failure of a bank that the treasury has to bail out. And both parties are responsible for it. It's not a it's not a one party versus the other. All right, well, I think we'll shift gears to the fee review. Um, and I'll mention, too, we do have one of our colleagues on the line, Patrick Wisdom, who's a member of our defined contribution team, who is instrumental in the analysis we're going to go through. So I'll walk us through. He's also available for any questions. Um, so looking at yes. it's the next document, the fee, the administrative fee review. There we go. Um, so, Board and staff have been extremely diligent and proactive in looking at fees and always keeping participants' interest 
front of mind, which has served them well. As part of that process, Callan helps you all evaluate the administrative fees. So think of these as the fees paid to Empower to record keep all of these assets and manage the participant accounts. Uh, it's not as simple to benchmark these. So administrative fees are more complex. They're based on the size of the plan, the number of participants, the number of payroll, just generally the complexity. Um, has a big bearing on that. So contrast that to something pretty straightforward like an S&P 500 index fund. That information is readily available to see what the median is and what the fees available are. On administration, it's not that simple, again, because it's so custom and so specific to each plan. So we've developed a process to help with that. Um, so we do a comprehensive, in order to help you first document the fees and then to help you see, okay, is this reasonable, is this fair? better, where are we? We benchmark that by looking at, uh, first we do a comprehensive evaluation. We did this first back in 2020. And we send out, it's a blind bid process. So we reach out to other large record keepers who could administer the plan. We give them high level details on the plan and say, hey, what would you bid? We take that information and provide an average to help evaluate your current fees versus we create that peer group, that median, if you will. That comprehensive analysis was done in 2020. They don't change much year to year, so we do annual refreshes where we look at information in our database, so a little bit higher level, a little bit broader. With the upcoming migration, um, we worked with staff and decided to continue with the annual review this year, and then next year we'll go back and redo the more comprehensive blind bid. So what we're looking at here is versus database information. Um, so the good news is in, in the process here, we're really looking to confirm, okay, back in 2020, we found that the fees were reasonable and very competitive and lower than median. So if you had gone to other providers, fees would have been higher. Good news. The good news this year is we're, we are confirming that is still the case. So fees are still reasonable and lower than the average other competitor. Okay. We've put together a lot of information. There's a lot of data points here. We want to be transparent and we want to arm you all as fiduciaries with information to make good decisions. Um, for, the, for the conversation today, I'm just going to focus on the key points and the key takeaway and sort of summarize all these numbers that we've put in front of you. So what you're looking at here on page two, this is just a look at the participant accounts that Empower is currently administering. In the top half, we have the 401k plan. You'll see over 280,000 participants. That's an increase. So the number of participants has gone up about 7% since 2019. The average and the median balance has gone down. So more participants, but a little bit lower balance than back in 19. When we look at the 457 plan on the bottom half, the opposite. So there you'll see the number of participants has decreased, but the average balance has increased. So that kind of sets the stage for what's what we're looking at in terms of what Empower is administering. Then we want to document the fees that are being paid. On page three, we look first at the 401k plan. So, so what are participants paying? How much revenue is Empower generating from these accounts? Again, a lot of data, a lot of information here. Um, we look at two components of the fees and the revenue. The first is that annual fee. So this is the cost to take in the payroll, administer, do all the meetings, everything that you hear about from Mike and Matt and their team every quarter. That's all in that, that unit cost, if you will, that annual fee. And you'll see that's gone down from $31 to $26. And we know that effective January of next year, it'll go down again to $25. So we've seen that trending in the right direction, um, generating savings for participants. We also want to look at some of the implicit costs and sources of revenue for Empower, which is uh, a big one of those is loan generation. So they charge $60 to originate a loan for each participant. That has stayed the same. The number of loans originated has decreased over the years. So that is also a decrease in revenue. So when you bring all that together, the participant fee is, or the overall aggregate uh, revenue generated by participants has gone down from $34.61 to $28.64. So participants are saving $5.97 on average, which is almost a million dollars in savings. So again, just confirming good news there in terms of the trend and the direction. Uh, page four shows a similar view for the 457 plan, just smaller, it's a smaller plan. So the dollar amounts are a little bit smaller. And when you bring it all together on page five, and fees are coming down. And if you think about some participants having a balance in both plans, they're generating even more savings. So not just 
five dollars, but ten dollars next year would be twelve with that additional fee saving. So the numbers themselves are trending in the right direction. Then the question is, okay, but relative to others, relative to peers, how do these look? How can we benchmark? How should we think about these? So then we go over to the next page. Uh, and if we can go ahead and go to page eight. What we've looked at here, I mentioned again, the, the annual review. So we're taking a look at plans from our database. So we looked for plans of similar size, roughly similar complexity. Uh, this is a broad view on this page. So taking in this, this 401k plans includes government plans, also corporate plans. So a pretty broad um, data set here to look at the 401k and the 457. So we've got the percentiles broken out. What you'll see here is on the 401k plan, the annual median is $20. When you look at the total revenue, it's $29. So keep in mind what I mentioned before, this is broader, right? So this includes a corporate plan might only have a few different payroll fees. You all have over a thousand employers. So some of these plans have different levels of complexity. So we've also looked at this versus government peers. Um, so here again, the total is still lower. So $28 versus 29. So still, um, so still looking good versus that broader universe. But importantly, on page nine, looking at other state deferred compensation plans, which is a good peer group for you all, because these tend to be larger plans, and they also tend to be more complex and facing some of those same uh, unique plan characteristics that you all face. So here, in terms of, kind of what that average peer group looks like, uh, still a little bit smaller. So the plans here range from, or sorry, participant count rather, ranges from 39,000 to 296,000, but on average 80 to 124,000. So a little bit smaller. Uh, the number, the number of, or sorry, the average is 794 in terms of employers, 794 employers versus about 1,100 here. So again, you can see those plans are a little bit less complex. When we look at the fees, though, the range of fees there is $18 to 67 with a median of 34 and an average of 38 compared to yours of $28. So even though the plan is larger and on average has more participants, more employers, we're still seeing good savings versus the median of other state deferred compensation plans. So again, saying, okay, we've seen the trend, the trend of the fees are coming down and we see that our fees are very competitive, lower than the medians of others from similar, similar government plans. Would you say that, uh, are you going to tell us about, a, are we at a percentile uh, like we do on the, on the pension plan? We don't have a percentile. So again, each plan is so specific that it's hard to really create a fair peer group to be able to say the top decile, bottom decile, that information is not as readily available here. Um, we can say you're significantly below a median, but whether that's top core top, top decile is a little bit harder to quantify in the administrative side versus it's a lot more straightforward on the investment side. So we can't side. say it's the lowest cost plan in North America. Can't. Like the world. <laughs> can't say that. World domination. <laughs> It is very competitive, and, and you all do have, you know, you, you've got these retirement education counselors and, um, you know, four services that go into it. So I think the goal here is not to be the cheapest, it's to be the most efficient. Okay. You want to have a low fee, and you want to get letters, um, like Matt mentioned, where it shows that, that participants are getting good service for that fee. So overall, good news there. Thank you. Kind of quick and high level questions. Anything else? Is that it? Any questions on the phone? All right. Uh, hearing now, we'll go to, to uh, Chris, who's uh, still filling in. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, thank you, Treasurer, uh, for the board. Uh, for the next agenda item, uh, there's a recommendation in your uh, packet um, regarding kind of wedge capital, the small mid-cap value strategy. 
Um, as most of the board members are, are aware of, um, that strategy has been on the watch list for quite some time. Um, it was put on the, the watch list in Q4 of 2018. And uh, we've reached a point where staff and Callen kind of feel that a recommendation to find a replacement for this strategy is, is warranted. Um, we have three main considerations which, which led us to this conclusion. Uh, a lot of this has already been discussed over time with the board, some of the concerns we've had, which is why they were on the watch list to begin with. Uh, but the three main uh, considerations are the decline in assets under management, changes within the organization, and continued underperformance of the strategy. So looking at assets under management, uh, we've seen a decrease in the AUM of not necessarily the specific strategy we're in, but the associated strategies within um, this small mid-cap value mandate. Uh, as a reminder, this mandate is a 50-50 blend of the small cap value and the mid-cap value. And if you look on uh, page two of, of the recommendation, if uh, you can go there, Patty, um, you can see that as I just mentioned, the, the strategy that we're actually in, the small mid-value assets have been fairly steady over the last five years, but the other two strategies which make up this one, the mid-value and the small value, have seen significant declines in assets under management over time, um, with the mid-value having approximately $4 billion in assets under management in 2018 and is down to about $267 million at the end of the quarter. And the small value having about $1.6 billion in 2018, and that has decreased to about $330 million. So in aggregate, these strategies have gone from you know, north of $6 billion in AUM to, to less than two, about $1.6 billion in AUM um, at the end of uh, March. So that's obviously a concern in terms of, of the specific strategies we're in. Uh, also, we've seen a decrease in, in firm-wide AUM pretty significantly in the last five years as well. Um, they had about 13 billion in 2018 and currently have about 7.9 billion in AUM. So that's, that's close to a 40% de decrease in, in assets under management firm-wide. And you know, as assets decline, the, the primary concern is that the firm may have to make difficult personnel decisions to maintain profitability. So um, it's certainly a, a high concern for us. Uh, and that brings us kind of to the next consideration, which is the organizational changes. We have started to see uh, organizational changes um, the last few years with, with the strategy itself and with the firm. Um, as we've noted in previous meetings, in 2020, the co-lead of the mid-cap strategy stepped away. In 2022, an, an equity analyst left and was not replaced. And then more recently, uh, they announced two more departures um, by the end of this fiscal year, by the end of June, a client portfolio manager and uh, another analyst, uh, neither of whom will be replaced. So as we were starting to see big changes on the organization, the, the staffing is being decreased. I think they'll have 35 total uh, staff come July 1. Um, so again, an another concern and kind of a red flag as we look at these mandates. Um, you know, Weston talked about kind of people and process being the, the biggest driver of outperformance over time. And then obviously we, we, we believe that as well and starting to see changes in people which may lead them to change their process um, which leads us to have you know less optimism that they'll be able to outperform over time so looking at performance um, obviously they've been on the watch list they initially entered the watch list for having uh, underperformance of three years for a number of quarters in a row um, we haven't really seen that turnaround we've seen performance continue to be challenged uh, we felt that they had an opportunity to turn around in, in 2022 and, and early this year as quality stocks generally rebounded. Uh, that hasn't been really materialized at all as they had another setback in, in Q1 of this year. They did have a 1.2% exposure to Signature Bank um, as of the end of last year, which, uh, which had a pretty big negative impact on their relative performance. And in fact, they were the only active manager we had within either the DB plan or the DC plan that had exposure to either Silicon Valley or Signature Bank. So certainly uh, not a good position to be in. Um, and that's out of a combined 300 managers or, or, or things. Yeah, I mean, on the equity side, a little bit less, but yeah, I mean, we have a lot of managers across both of those, um, you know, pools of capital. And then looking at kind of longer term performance strategy continues to struggle as well. Um, 
underperforming its benchmark over the three and the five year period. Uh, and it also struggled uh, versus its peer group with the portfolio ranking in the 77th percentile over three years and the 88th percentile over five years. So continue to struggle. We feel like there is likely better uh, managers to, to replace them and, and which hopefully will have better performance going forward. So kind of in recognition of all those risks, all those considerations, you know, we, we feel that, you know, now's the time to, to do a search to hopefully find a better choice to complement the existing managers in the strategy who have been performing extremely well. So um, that's our ask of the board today is, is to consider, uh, you know, approving a formal search to, to find a replacement for Wedge. And then once that search is completed, we'll, uh, we'll bring a recommendation back to the board. Happy to answer any questions on any of them. Several questions. So going back to page 15, why, why is the option of not uh, taking these assets and spreading it among index funds? Why, why is that not an option? Uh, I mean, it could be an option. I think this is an active choice. There is a passive choice as well. So if participants want a passive option, they have a passive option. So, you know, we have a passive and an active option which each, within each one of these strategies. So the more passive you have in an active sleeve, the less active it becomes, right? Um, you know, it becomes less expensive, but it becomes less active, which is really the kind of the mandate for that part of the that choice within the, the, the lineup. Why why wouldn't we vote to to end this relationship and and I'm very concerned about everything you've talked about, everything I've heard of the last several years about this manager. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know why we would, I'm fearful of waiting until we find you know, someone else to marry that we're, you know, that we're exposed, we're at risk. So why would, why couldn't the board vote to dissolve this relationship? as quickly as possible and just park the money while the search is going on. Yeah, I, that's certainly an option. Um, you know, if we did something like that, I would recommend putting that in some type of value, Russell 1000 value mandate. That's fine. Um, just because you want to keep the consistency with the structure and having it not overweight or underweight growth or value and have it a core structure overall. Um, but the other consideration of that is you would be incurring kind of transaction fees and transition fees twice in doing that. So I guess we need to balance the risk of keeping it with a manager for the next three to six months versus, um, you know, transitioning it quickly and then transitioning it again in six months, right? So I guess you kind of have to weigh those two options there. How quickly can staff bring back a recommendation for a manager replacement? So we've already started the process just to ensure that, you know, we felt we could find a suitable replacement. So we're already somewhat down the road on that. But, um, you know, I think it'd be a stretch to bring it back with the next board meeting. But certainly by the Q4 board meeting, we would have everything tied off. And that's a long time to get off the Titanic. It is if that's where we're on. But again, I mean, I, I don't know if there's any real imminent threat to the strategy, but for certainly from a long-term perspective, it's not a great place to be. So and I don't know if Callan had any other thoughts on that. In terms of the Titanic reference, I think we're making this recommendation now, our staff is making the recommendation now ahead of where that ship can't turn, right? So we're, we've been working on this, trying to stay ahead of it. In the next three to six months, we don't expect significant changes. So how much money do we have there? 280 million. And then how, what, how much do they have? Oh, what do you mean? Wedge has this 280 with Wedge. And how much does Wedge have? Oh, in total, 7.9 billion. So, I mean, they still have their focus really in their where they've been, I guess, gaining assets really more on the quantitative equity side, right? right? So, this is in the fundamental equity sleeve, which has been kind of declining over time. So, you know, they have a significant amount of assets. Again, I don't think the shop is likely to, to have any real short term issues, but. I mean, this is a public meeting the public agenda. This is a public board book. And when we are having this discussion about a North Carolina company about exiting, uh, you don't know how, I don't think any, 
any traditional way of thinking about the ship turning or the ship sinking, I don't think it applies here. I think that thing you could get it run. Uh, and then we'd be the last people sitting in, in this investment. And uh, I think I think this board and the staff have been very generous toward Wedge and very patient with Wedge, or at least the whole time I've been here. And <clears throat> I'm not opposed. I have one vote. I'm not opposed to uh, liquidating this investment uh, and putting it in the Russell uh, index fund uh, to protect our members. What what type of notification would be due to members if a change like that was made? There's bound to be some regulatory compliance. Yeah, I mean we do need to give notification. Um, I'm not sure if there's a specific regulatory time frame. I don't think so. This yeah. says this is an underlying manager. Right. Yeah, it's not the, it's not a change in the overall overall no mandate. But that's typically how how you know if it's an underlying manager. That's one of the benefits of having a white label option is you can make a change without any sort of participant notice and notification. It doesn't disrupt them. Mean. They don't see a change. Yeah. As long as there's no change to the strategy as a whole, Chris, right? Well, I'm hearing two different things. Chris, so Chris, this is a, this is this is a white label manager. It's. This is part of your white label fund. And since it's a white label manager, the restrictions or the, the notification things may be uh, less onerous. Right? Right. Treasurer, this is a question. You got the floor. Uh, I, I was just wondering, you said move the money into BlackRock. Are you discussing that as a, is, are you saying that as a temporary uh, step while we are looking for another manager to replace Wedge, or are you saying that you'd like to do that on a permanent basis? Uh, Christopher had mentioned moving it into a, an index fund. I don't know if you used to, did you say which one? I was just saying that it would, need to, it would likely need to go into a Russell 1000 value index fund because we need to keep the... Do we have a Russell 1000 value index fund internally? Uh, Russell, yeah, 2500. 2500. Yeah, 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 sorry. Yeah, we Russell don't have that internally. Uh, the value one. Or the index fund. I mean, we manage... <laughs> we do have assets in the Russell... You mean that we manage internally here yeah. within the DB plan? That's a different conversation too because of, um, all right. So let's go back to Lorraine. Now, Lorraine, I'm just, I'm recommending, I'm not, I don't have a strong opinion about where it goes, Lorraine. I'm having a strong opinion about getting it out of where it is. Uh, let me clarify I mean, my Titanic. Uh, let, 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 let me try Lorraine. Lorraine, go ahead. That's all right. Yes, I have no objection to using BlackRock as a proxy for the uh, wedge amount because you know it it does keep us from being out of SMED, which was not our intention. But uh, I, I I just would not want to make a uh, a permanent decision today. But I have I have no objection to using a proxy. In fact, I would be in favor of it. Thank you, Ryan. I was going to clarify my Titanic remark that uh, I'm not suggesting Wedge is going to hit the iceberg and sink. I'm suggesting there's a crisis that maybe we need to accelerate the process to find a replacement. Yeah, I mean, again, we can certainly do all we can to bring it at the next board meeting. Um, like I said, we've already done a good amount of the work. We just have to tie off a bunch of stuff. but. Um, we can certainly accelerate the recommendation at the next board meeting um, as well. If uh, what is the timing and notifying them and actually the money leaving their firm? I mean, that's the benefit. Also, it's, it's a separate account at our custodian, right? So we technically control the assets, right? I mean, we could technically terminate them at any point in time and move the assets the next day if we had to, right? Um, it's a benefit of not being in a commingled type structure. Okay. We have control of the assets. So from that perspective, I mean, 
you know, we, we can do it. There's really no time constraint with the manager itself. Yeah. Any other communications to any participants or anything like that, that's a different. And then I've got a question. Go ahead. This is Steve. Um, to, to, to a comment and a question, I may have misinterpreted the, the numbers when I sent an email out the other day. It appears that the wedge small mid value has $980 million and the wedge mid value and small value individually have for the two that have lost substantial assets. So maybe we haven't lost as many assets as originally it looked like to me. Uh, we're not half that portfolio. We're maybe 25% of that portfolio now, but um, I'm of the opinion that it's time to make a change and sooner than later is better. And maybe it would be an alternative that since it is a non-commingled portfolio, you could get BlackRock to easily convert it to a to their uh, value index and maybe minimize some of the transaction costs by doing it that way as an interim step to finding a replacement. Yeah, I mean, BlackRock could certainly take control. I mean, we'd have to talk with them, obviously. Um, but again, if we're transitioning this to a full replication kind of index fund, which is typically what all of our index funds are, then there would still be the transaction costs with um, trading all these securities. Yeah, I would worry if you make two fund changes, that's going to be more, even more confusing to the participants for the time you go to an index and you can then go find an active and go back over to another manager. My opinion is we just need to accelerate the uh, due diligence for a new manager. So can we go back? To, sorry, I know if you guys need to go, I understand because we've got planes and trains and other clients. So hmm. don't forget. We appreciate that, Mr. Treasurer. We're good for okay. a little while longer. All right. So going back to Steve's point, so that we don't get glass uh, of the things that we're invested in, what are the percentages of their AUM? What percentage do we represent of their AUM of the things that we're invested in, not the firm itself? Right. So to clarify on, on that, that one slide that, that's up right now, uh, which shows it. So the, the, the specific strategy we're in, the small mid value, that's where the assets have been fairly stable. But that strategy is 50% the small cap value and 50% the mid cap value. So looking at each one of those underlying mandates is appropriate as well, right? So that's where I was getting at where the specific strategy we're in, we're 280 million of close to a billion. So, you know, 30% of it roughly. Um, which we typically don't, we're not 30% of anything. Oh, as far as if you, when you come to me with new investments, and somebody says we're going to be thirty percent of this. Yeah. You, I mean, it's you it's a big don't, percentage. You don't of, bring that to me generally. Yeah, I mean it's a big percentage of yeah. of, okay. of a specific strategy. Okay. All right. But yeah, but the the assets that declined was really the mid value and the small value declined significantly over the last five years, and they've continued to see declines in those. So that's really where the concern is. It's it is looking at all of those together more than just the specific strategy we were at. And that's what I was saying, where it was you know, north of six billion five years ago, and now it's 1.6 billion in aggregate rate. Where, uh, that's, that's quite a large change. So I'm confused by the relative static nature of the combined fund and this huge drop off in these other two. I've never seen anything like that. So it means people left to take their clients with them is what I'm guessing. So if you're wondering what if the philosophy is going to change, if that's true, no, it certainly is going to change. And again, it this is no longer be complementary within this. Exactly. Yeah. No, you're exactly right. of, of mid small cap trading that adds the 300 basis points that you've been showing up there. So and again, their performance actually the last year has been better. They have outperformed the benchmark by a small amount, which again it hasn't hurt. The white label fund as a whole, which you saw, it's outperformed pretty significantly. The other two managers have done very well. But um, so their performance 
hasn't been as bad, I guess, as it was previously, but we just don't have confidence that it's going to get better going forward, given all these other changes. So, Do you have any idea of how many stocks are in, included in that? How many discrete equities would be part of that? Um, it's pretty diversified. Yeah, I want to that. Um, well, we're talking what James's point, in addition to what he's saying, we're typically talking about stocks that are more liquid also. On top of what he's saying, then these are things that are more illiquid, generally speaking, on top of whatever he's saying. I mean, when you get down into the smaller cap space, they become more illiquid, right? But, I mean, they have a good number of securities. Well, we're big in this fund, but we might not be that big in the market cap of the individual stocks. That would be what would concern me. It's just unloading a load of, you know, taking one day and... Yeah, and again, and, and if we're doing, regardless of the transition we decide to do, whether it's to an index fund or what, that's part of the process in general is that, you know, we, we utilize, typically utilize a transition manager to get from point A to point B for that exact purpose, right? You don't want to be selling into a market with illiquid stocks. You know, if it takes a few days to do that, to ensure that it, we're not affecting the, the market and affecting the price of any individual security, that, that's really a process that we go through as we transition to, to any new manager, anytime you make any of these transitions. So that's a, a separate process that we take, and it's not just... I give all these assets to a new manager and they got to change it in one day kind of thing. That, that's not how it, that's not the process that, that we, we take. It's, it's more of a risk management approach, I guess, to it. And they hold 139 securities, Sorry, 139 securities. Okay. Some of those are mid cap, some small, so varying. Well, I have an interest in taking control of these assets since they're in a separate fund. Uh, and and transitioning to a BlackRock index fund, and and then you folks work on what you think you need to work on as far as uh, whether to leave it there or whether to to search for other places to put it. That would be uh, that would be my that's my instinct about this whole thing. So, Reed, what kind of motion would you need to do all that? We would need a motion to terminate. Well, it, it, it really depends whether the board wants to terminate now, move to the index, as you were saying, or or just accelerate or just accelerate the ask staff to come back, leave it where it is, and ask staff to come back. Both of, at the next meeting, both of those. Would require motion to vote, but they are different. I would say if we did the latter, we'd be talking about 2024. I'm just not comfortable with that. I mean, this is the record, but yeah. by the time it all got done. Uh, yeah, question Can staff come back in 30 days with a recommendation and we could do a phone uh, a call meeting to vote on it? I think 30 days would be tough just given the search process and the time to, to qualify a manager. There's a, be a lot big governance thing. question. So prior to the pandemic, staff would typically visit the managers on site. So go to visit the candidates before coming to the board. That was paused and Zoom was used as a substitute for that. So I think there's a question as, and I don't know the answer to it, um, but I think that's part just to explain the hesitation of <laughs> why we're pausing on the timeline. There's nothing to say you wouldn't come back and say, we don't want to, we won't take this $200 million. We want to put a hundred million with this play people we're already doing business with another hundred million with these other people we're already doing business with that, um, that could come back. That way. So, so this is Wyndon. So if I'm not mistaken, we have a, a, a recommendation we have to vote on. Correct. Is that correct? Yes, and I was I was probably lack of a better word, Wendon, trying to strengthen that recommendation. And okay, but, but so so the recommendation is, is: Are we gonna move away from them? Right. So the the work goes into when and how. Yes. And and so, are we trying to solve for that today? 
for the when and how there's, today? There, there's some there's some slight fiduciary risk of if we go if we move away from them now uh, and just and put it in a money market fund or some other type of short term investment that we're probably not in line with what we're supposed to be doing, and that's why we were right. just, that's why the idea of transitioning into an index fund would make sure that our members are sort of uh, to, to a large degree held harmless. So, so even so, so e even if it's, it's so like when you when you move an, a customer account from one manager to another, it usually takes ninety days for that, right? It's, it may have gotten better over time with the technology, but it takes that long. So we're making a decision that we want to go to another ma another manager. So I think I don't know if we can solve for we don't have, I don't think we have enough information to answer your questions today. From what I'm listening yeah, to, we're not, going, we're not going to another manager. We're just going to an index fund. Right, but I'm not sure, right. But given all the questions that are happening, in the, I think at least three questions have popped up. I'm not sure if we can answer those questions today. And I think he said, um, I can't remember his name, but he was saying that there's a there's certain things that we need to get in place to move that way. I agree, we probably need to move away from, from this particular manager, but I know I don't know if we can answer those questions today my suggestion is and to I would terminate. Like to the... i'm sorry when i interrupted you i i uh, I, I, I think i, I I'm, I'm just listening to what he said he's uh he was saying that he doesn't have all the all the, we don't have all the answers to be able to to make that move today and or is that um, or did i hear that incorrectly don't have all the answers to as far as the time it would take to do the proper due diligence on a, another active manager search. We do not have that information. But the board has to approve us doing a search. That's what we were coming forth with was and we can do all three. We can terminate this manager. We could put it in an index fund and direct the board to do a search. Do the direct the staff to yes, do a search. We can do all three of those things when and today. Yes. Okay. Yep. Qu qu question uh, to Chris. This is Steve again. Roughly 139 securities. I mean, what kind of dollar amount are we probably talking in expense to convert that to a BlackRock Russell value index? Any idea? I mean, is it five or ten thousand dollars on 30, 300 million, or is it a larger number? No, I mean, it'd probably be a larger number than that. It's hard to, we can run those numbers, but it's not something we've run. Um, I would say it's probably going to be closer to uh, probably seventy-five to $100,000. And I mean, but, uh, and Steve, it also goes back to, uh, there is a chance that 40, 50, or 60% of the stocks that Wedge owns, would also be the stocks that the index would have to purchase. So there would be no transition of that. There would be no buying or selling. And until you put those things up on a mirror and see how they look at each other. To, to, Correct. Yeah. So you did that. Just to, I mean, no, that's accurate, but the Russell 2500 index, which is the benchmark. So the Russell 2500 value, they would have to buy About basically half of that. 1600. Maybe securities. It's 1800 securities. In the value. So so value. 18, so they would have to hold 1800 securities to replicate that index. Right now they hold 139. Um, they'll likely a lot of overlap there, but um, but there would be a lot of uh, a lot of trading. Yes, but there would be a, a good amount of trading to get to that. One last question I have. Do we have any risk or liability to a participant saying I, I had an active manager. You didn't put me in an active manager. I mean, I don't think there's any real definition on. Okay. Again, we'll still be active in that. We have two other sixty percent of the uh, of that will be active, right? So right now, it's a third. third well, thirty percent with all three active managers, and we have a ten percent allocation to. So our answer, if, if you don't like this passive, here's the other active managers. 
to pick one of them. Well, again, they only see it at the white label level. So, okay. that, so they, they're not seeing anything below the water. Okay. And so they wouldn't really know unless they really dug into it. Okay. If, if we took out took out, you know, A and put in B. Got it. That makes sense. What they do see, though, is the B disclosures. It goes right. down and then it goes back up. And that's where you start to get questions. And we do disclose what percent in our in the white label actives. We do have the breakdowns of the underlying managers, so there would be there would be a communication about the index portion of it going up. It just a matter of how long it's in. All right. Um, so I mean, my, my view. I mean, it's it's it really depends on risk the board thinks we're taking with holding wedge while we can finish this search to find a potential recommendation, right? If the risk is high enough, the board wants to take that off the table, we can certainly put it in a, an index fund in the in the meantime, finish out the search, and then go from there. Or if the board's comfortable with the recommendation as is and uh, just find in a replacement, you know, we can prioritize and try to do everything we can to get this done by the next big board meeting, we can do that as well. And it have to go into index fund, can't go in a stiff or anything of that nature. Yeah, I mean, again, if it's in a cash type vehicle, then it's it's, it's not the strategy that okay. that we we have, right? That you would probably need a disclosure. Yeah. In advance to participants. All right, you're changing the strategy. So, uh, what's when if we vote to terminate and search, when would their when would they stop having their hands on the wheel? Uh, after we finish recommending a replacement and only, transition, only then. then. Yes, mm -hmm. Wedge would be in charge of the mandate until then. So if we bring it to the next board meeting, at the end of August, then we would have to do a transition in September to the new manager. Um, so it would likely be till sometime in September. So if they decided that they wanted to swing, not that they would do that, to swing for the fences. They blew out it. They sold everything in this portfolio. They decided to swing for the fences. There's nothing we could do while we're in this holding pattern that prevent to prevent them from doing that, is there? No. I mean, again, they're managing their strategy with their other man with their other clients as well, right? So, I mean, they're not good. They can't do something different to our pool of capital that they would do within that strategy, right? Okay. But they do have an IPS that they follow. And there's yeah, some, yeah. So, that, I mean, they have the guidelines that they have to follow. So, if they're going outside their guidelines, then we get a bigger problem too, right? Right. It's with, like any of our managers. We have guidelines in place that we make sure that they're following the guidelines and following the strategy that we hired them to do, right? Well, a few times I've had to terminate an individual. You don't let them hang around for three months. When they know they're going to be terminated. Yeah, I mean, there is a risk to that. I mean, it's, it's part of it. But again, it's what's the likelihood? How big is that risk, right? I mean, they're still going to manage the portfolio. They're still going to manage it alongside their other clients and within our investment guidelines. Um, so, I mean, we certainly have some things in place to mitigate that to some extent. Um, and obviously, that would not be a good long-term situation if they were to do something outside of that which could potentially lead to lawsuits and all that stuff that would not be a good long-term solution for any manager especially one that still has a pretty big business right it's not like you said there's still eight billion in assets under management and, and looking at it as a standalone a billion dollar smid cap fund is still a sizable fund yeah. it, the, they you know this is not putting them at kind of risk it's just the changes that are going to occur you may feel like you can't answer this but i think you can if we were to sit in other board meetings that you sit in do you think this type of recommendation is happening in other parts of the of the country i i can answer for because everything in a public forum goes to the press and this went to the press before we even had a chance to Talk with you all about it. This um, did? Yes. Once oh, it got released into the. Days again. They, they watch like a hawk. They read your. They read okay. the agenda and okay. read the memo. So. Um, I've never uh, talked to them. So. Just the, call us. <laughs> all right. The. Uh, they're what. The, 
the mid cap value strategy was there was a larger California public plan that uh, put them up for a search. So that mid cap value strategy is going to go down. So you're starting to see some some outflows that are continuing here. But you know, in terms of that mid cap strategy, there hasn't been anything announced that um, you know that we are aware of. Other clients, I, I, I think there's limited exposure across Calen clients. Okay. So. But if I were a salesperson of a Smith cap strategy, I would take this headline on this product, even though it might not relate to that, and say, you need to get out of, I mean, I would use that against them, even though it may not be, yeah. maybe factual, but not accurate. On, on Thursday, when I hit the press, Elizabeth and I had a whole lot of new friends. <laughs> were pinging us and saying we, we want the fact of the matter is we've gone pretty far down the process uh, to when we got to this place we could act pretty quickly and um, so and this is a pretty standard process yeah. I mean, for for all kinds of these similar type plans right it's right. not where we you know we get the the approval to do a search and finish the search and then come back and find a recommendation to, to replace it. But yeah, I mean, there is that, that, that time period in between is how big of a risk that is. So, so let me ask Steve's question a little bit differently, knowing the work that's been done, knowing 30 days may be tough. Is there a period less than 90 days, but more than 30 that you might feel comfortable with to where we can still maybe have an interim board meeting prior to the August meeting that we could, in fact, recommend a new manager? Yeah, I mean, I think that would be pretty tough. Okay. I mean, again, I don't want to rush the due diligence either to the sure. extent where I don't feel like we did it enough and we're recommending someone that we, you know, we rushed through the process. And again, we've already gone a good enough way down the road. I mean, a normal process will take at least six months, but we're already far enough down the road where I feel like within three months we should we should be able to. Uh, I feel like that's that's certainly doable. Christopher's um, wearing two hats here, by the way. He's, he's double. Just wanted to ask a question. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I just want to make sure that, again, I don't want to rush that other part of it either to the extent where I feel like we're not doing everything we should be doing from a fiduciary standpoint. So, um, you know, putting that in a 30 to 60 day time frame, I mean, 90 days is probably, it should be sufficient. I think we can definitely get that done, um, certainly with a lot of Callan's help. But uh, Is it possible that Callan will be coming back to us with a index fund option to replace which? As with past searches, I would assume it would be the same. The last time we did a search, we brought active candidates and also a passive option for the board to consider just to, to see if you went past and this is what it would look like. So we can we can do that as well. And the passive well, option. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, um, Ms. Chavella, so my question is, listening to this uh, conversation, I'm wondering, are there some really high risk here in making this decision? You mean you mean the risk of delaying it or the risk of not doing it? Uh, really, if you could tell me about both. Sorry, Shabella. Both. Beat that. Both. Yeah, both. Okay. Yeah, I think that I, I personally think there's a risk of not accelerating it personally but that's just my so you'll be coming back to us not just with active recommendations yeah we can put the, the passive on the, on the board and make have that as an option but the passive recommendation may not be the one you mentioned a moment ago i mean it'll, it'll be a passive russell 2500 value fund because it, it needs to match the strategy of the fund as a whole right even though this one only has 137 now stocks yeah yeah so the passive option would be a full replication like we do with any other passive okay. mandate right. right so it would okay. it would likely be that um i mean we can do the analysis and look at that the, the the issue comes in how much passive is too much passive in an active choice right so that that's the decision that that'll happen there right if so this very is supposed quickly to be active, recommendation could come back that it goes into the russell 2500 passive and if if and it would already be there if the board decided to take it out of wedge now and, and put it in there. The recommendation could come back to put it in this fund where we will have already put it. 
Yeah, I mean, I could bet that's, that's that's an option. I mean, we haven't done that full analysis, and again, it goes back to how much okay. active is how much passive is too much in an active mandate, right? I mean, you'd have forty percent in act or in passive in a mandate that was ninety percent active, right? Okay, uh, I'll throw it out and stash. Let's go back to what Wenon said. Uh, read your property to repeat the motion or or repeat legally what you're asking us to do. Well, and um, I think Wendon captured it well. There's the one of making the change with wedge, and then there's two make the change plus do the where and then do some at least some of the where and the how now. Are we gonna just do the search as recommended by staff, or are we going to do uh, the search plus the move to index? So one of, one of those, I, I think those are the two at a high level, at least those are the two options that have been. Is there, a, is there a strong will by the board, and uh, we're going to wrap this up, is uh, to to uh, terminate and put it in the index fund and then and then do a search. Is there any, is there a strong objection to that? Two-step. Yeah. Possibly two-step. Yeah. Possibly, yeah. Is there any strong objection to that? Strong objection to placing it in the index fund? Is that the question? Yeah, terminating, placing it in an index fund, and then let the staff do their search beyond that. I, I would su I would support that motion. Okay. All right. <laughs> would you like to make that motion? That is a value index fund, though, correct? Yeah, it would be. Yeah, because we want to keep consistent with the current strategy that, that's in there. I'll be glad to make the motion that the relationship with Wedge, and Rick can correct me, uh, be terminated and those funds be moved to the Russell 2500 while in parallel staff comes back with a recommendation as to whether the fund should remain in the Russell 2500 or go to some other manager of asset fund. Uh, that act, act accurately captures what the treasurer said earlier and the subsequent conversation has been. So I think that's an accurate uh, motion. And the reason for my supporting that as I, as I go through and look at the performance, um, you know, I'm the newest guy here, but as I go through and, and look, Wedge has been on the watch list since the fourth quarter of 2018. But we don't have a motion. We don't have a we second. We do have a motion. We don't have a second. Yeah, I'll second uh, Mr. James uh, has seconded. Can I, can I clarify that it's at the Russell 2500 value index just to make sure it's correct yes. on the record? Thank you. And does that go to a typical, go to a, a certain manager like BlackRock to manage? Yeah, we'll have to. I mean, I would. Yeah, I would since st staff would have discretion which manager they're going okay. to do. Yep. There's a motion second on the floor to do that, to do that. Does anybody need any, any more discussion or any more clarification about it? Hearing no uh, call for discussion or more clarification, uh, I'll have the clerk call the roll. Treasurer Falwell? Aye. Chavella Thomas? Somebody might say no, I've never heard of Chavella? Aye. Lorraine Johnson? Aye. Bob Shea? Aye. Nels Roseland? Aye. Steve Bean? Aye. And Wendon Hibbler? Aye. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Can I just, uh, uh, just clarification for me? Since we're doing this additional step, the search to find a potential replacement may extend beyond the next meeting. Is that okay? Uh, okay. I just want to make sure because. All right. Uh, make you feel better? A little bit. <laughs> First quarter investment compliance summary report. Anything there? Uh, no, that one's quick. Nothing, nothing to report. We continue to monitor 
our divestment policies, um, executive order regarding the Chinese military companies, and we continue to monitor all investment guidelines with all of our managers and thing material report if you want to know public comment. And no one signed up for public comment. Uh, as we go around the horn, those that are there virtually, uh, uh, anybody would like to say or add anything? No, sir. Anybody in person? We have some new staff members here. This is Mary Conkey from Empower. She's uh, she's our I'm manager. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> they, they abandoned me. They said, they're all your own kids. So. With Mike and Matt, but she missed her ride. <laughs> as long as they left the brains in the room, that's all that matters. Oh, they definitely did. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought. All right. Hearing none, uh, I, I want to wish everybody a happy memorial. Safe Memorial Day. Uh, keep those that serve uh, in your thoughts and prayers because uh, it's a verb, not a noun. Uh, thank Tom and all the other veterans that are on this call for their uh, uh, participation in protecting our country. And we'll close our meeting in their honor. Do I hear a motion to adjourn? So moved. So moved. Second. Controller, second by Steve. Any further discussion? Hearing none. Clerk will call the roll for German. Treasurer Falwell. Aye. Shabella Thomas. Aye. Lorraine Johnson. Aye. James Lumpston. Aye. Craig Patterson. Aye. Wendy Hibbler. Aye. And Bob Shea. Aye. Aye. We're adjourned. Don't just stay in here a minute.